So good morning, everybody. Welcome to the February 15th, 2022 meeting of the Coward County Board of Commissioners. At this time, I'd like to ask Pastor Ben Holland if he would come and please give us an indication. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we pray for your blessings to be upon us, to be upon this county, for each citizen and resident that is here. Lord, we pray for our commissioners, and Lord, that you guide their discussions, their deliberations. Lord, for those who are part of our, our county, who are involved in advocacy, who are serving, who are working and living in this area. Lord, we pray that you equip each one of us so that we can be a blessing to one another and to give glory and honor to you. Lord, we do lift up the tensions that are rising along the Russian-Ukrainian border and for our military officers and soldiers that are heading in that direction. Lord, we pray in your sovereignty that you will bring a, a resolution uh, to, this, to this situation, as well as all of our international disagreements. But Lord, we pray for your guidance to be with us this morning. We pray for those who are here, that you bring wisdom, that you bring pre peace, and that, Lord, that you give direction. We thank you for this day, and we lift this, this day up to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So I want to thank Pastor Holland for joining us today in the invocation, and he's from the Dunkirk Baptist Church. And as uh, any clergy out there that would be willing to come in, please let us know. We're glad to have any and all of you. Next item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Are there any corrections or additions to the agenda as presented? Move to approve, Mr. President. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So uh, yesterday was President's Day, and I uh, just want to take a moment to you know, recognize President's Day to honor all of our past and current presidents and for their leadership uh, in this great country that we have, and want to make sure that we uh, pay homage to those individuals for the sacrifice that they gave and are giving. Um, so the, we've here at the office have had some uh, calls recently about the SMECO rate increase. Uh, just want to remind everybody SMECO is our local utility electric provider and that uh, they are a nonprofit organization. Uh, you know, they, they just like everyone else has seen an increase in cost and, you know, have to pass that along to cover their cost. And uh, we all recognize that when we go to the fuel pump every day and uh, power is mostly generated by fossil fuels. So uh, their cost of production increases right along with the cost of barrel oil, just like the gasoline that we buy every day. So um, we've had several requests that we should have them in before us to explain it, but uh, I think it's a little self-explanatory. And whenever SMECO does increase rates, they have to go before the Public Service, Service Commission and justify those rate increases that are approved by the Public Service Commission. So they just don't randomly raise rates, and uh, they got to go before the commission whether they're raising rates or lowering rates. So it just makes sure that the utility is financially functioning and make sure that uh, we all get the electricity that we need. So um, I don't believe we're going to have SMECO come in before us anytime soon to talk about that, but just wanted to make sure under everybody understood, understands, uh, you know, it's just a function of the, the environment that we're in today. Uh, the last thing is uh, Southern Maryland Skills USA competition. I want to congratulate the Calvert County Public School students who recently competed in the Southern Maryland Skills USA regional competition hosted by the Career and Technology Academy. Uh, so Calvert students brought home 23 medals, 9 gold, 7 silver, and 7 bronze. And they will be representing Calvert at the Skills USA Maryland State Leadership and Seals Conference in April. So we want to wish them the congratulations on their achievements and the best of luck as they move forward to states. That's all I have. Next item on the agenda is presentations, Department of Finance and Budget. Director Strand. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. morning, Commissioners. 
I'm going to read the memo and then I'll turn it over to Edie and Dr. Curry for any questions that you might have. Welcome to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Background. In October 2021, negotiations were held between the Board of Education and the bus driver slash contractors and an agreement was reached to provide the following concessions. An eight hour work day to increase in hourly salary rates to establish future cost of living increases based on CPI and that all other items initially on the negotiation list would be discussed at a future date. Discussion. On February 15, 2022, the BOE will be present, present to provide a financial update. Fiscal impact. The cost of the two items above is approximately $2.6 million. At the October 2021 meeting, the county expressed to the Board of Education that the cost would be split between the two entities. Due to the fiscal year 2021 positive financial results, the Board of Education and the recent influx of federal funding to the BOE, the county would like to see if the BOE could cover the entire portion of the $2.6 million. Conclusion. Depending on the outcome of the meeting, staff seeks the Board of County Commissioner's guidance on funding a portion of the bus driver slash contractors agreement. Thank you. Dr. Curry, thanks for joining us. Mask off, okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Gentlemen, thank you for having us here today. Um, uh, if I could, I want to share a little, a little bit of history. First of all, on this particular deal, um, yeah, we all remember what the fall was like and the, uh, the challenges with uh, enough bus drivers to start the year, and then we started having uh, periodic strikes. And on, um, on October 28th, we got a letter from the commissioners offering assistance to uh, help with the matter in any way. On October 29th, we had uh, a bad weather day. And um, <clears throat> on that day, we scheduled a meeting uh, at, at our office, at the Board of Education offices with representatives of our contractors and our drivers, talking about the kinds of things they needed and they wanted. And, and um, we got contacted by um, uh, Mr. Willis asking if they could uh, come over, and Mr. Weems, Mr. Willis came over. At about a time, we were finishing our calculations, and um, uh, I remember very distinctly, uh, I said to them <clears throat> kind of discreetly, well, it looks like $2.6 million, and they looked at each other and said, well, 1.3 would be half. Can we go half? And they both nodded, and they looked at me and said, we'll go half. Now, I, I point that out because it's not unusual practice. We have a great partnership with the commissioners, um, beginning with uh, uh, one of those groups back there before a couple of you were on the commission when we were building Northern High School. And the state told us that uh, they didn't think we needed to build a high school any bigger f than one big enough for 1,250 kids. And the commissioner said, no, we anticipate lots of growth in the north. We don't see w how we could, it's a good idea. Uh, but the state still said our participation is this much. When asked to put a dollar figure on what it would cost to put initial, additional square footage on in order to have accommodation for 1,500 kids at Northern High School, uh, George Leah shared with you about $6 million. The question was, would you split it? <clears throat> we said yes, and uh, the Board of Education set aside $3 million, and you set aside $3 million, and we got the Northern High School we wanted. At another time, the commissioners uh, expressed an interest in having visitor bleachers at Patuxa High School. Would you go halfsies? We went halfsies. At another time, uh, with a great concern for safety after a school shooting in Southern Maryland, um, uh, there was an offer from the commissioners to share the cost of enhanced safety. We added doors where we didn't have doors. We put locks where we didn't have locks. We built uh, vestibules so that no one could get into a school without first being steered into our office. The cost was $4 million, and the county commissioners split that, $2 million each. I bring all this up because with all those previous halvesies, there was never any question about, well, how much do you have now? And can you pay the bill? Can you pay our share now that it looks like you might be ahead a little bit? So this is an unusual request. 
from the commissioners. I po point out one more. Uh, there are times when we, uh, I think, due to uh, prudent fiscal management, uh, don't always need to ask you. <clears throat> we were struggling with bids for Beach Elementary this year. We didn't have the money uh, that was budgeted uh, that you all had approved for Beach Elementary. It was uh, above bid. <clears throat> But we found, and it is mentioned in this uh, memo, uh, we found that uh, our federal grant money, ESSER grant, uh, with some of that could be used for facilities if it couched in the right way. So we were able to use $3 million of ESSER three to be able to afford to build Beach Elementary and not have to come back to the county commissioners and say, can you help us out with that? Um, so I, I point those out once again to say, uh, oh, let me tell you one other. I think we have enough savings on another construction project, some of our HVAC work at Southern Middle, that's going to allow us to take the savings, and we may be able to build visitor bleachers at Northern High School. Uh, so once again, without come, having to come and ask you to participate in that. So the request was rather unusual, and, and we're, we are here to, to say, um, um, we would need to know if that means any in the future we need to be cautious whenever we agree to a 50 50 split so dr curry i think the intent today is that uh, last year uh, you know the county saw significant surplus at the end of the year you all saw significant surplus at the end of the year i think today the request is just to update us on where you are in your current budget before we and we are going to honor our commitment. It's just a matter of updating us on where you are in your budget and your projections. If, uh, if ED, I'm sorry, ED, if ED anticipates another surplus, then I guess we would question the request. Uh, our, our offer was always to cover if there was a shortfall that, you know, you have your budget, which we provide every year to operate within. Um, and today our intent, as I said, is just to make sure that if the money's needed, we're going to supply whatever is needed to meet those needs. It's just a matter of where we currently sit today in our budget, just like we would do with our own departments. If a department came in today and said we need an extra million dollars, we're just going to make sure that we've done our due diligence, and uh, at the end of the day, we're going to provide whatever funds are necessary. I appreciate that, and I'll hand it over to Ms. Hutchins, our Chief Financial Officer. But I remind you that this present year's budget, when we made our request budget request last year, we only asked you for a dollar more than the previous year because we used a significant amount of that savings that uh, we uh, found when we had a year of virtual instruction and um, well it was a half year of virtual instruction a half year of hybrid thank you dr. Curry good morning. good morning so at this time we have done several analyses we have not completed our analyses however but some of our analyses yield that we expect to fully expand some budget monies like for utilities we expect that with the higher costs in utilities that we will not have savings in utilities this year which we have had for several years now we also expect that based on the usage for substitute teachers in the special education category Right now, that is trending lower than usual. So we do expect to have some savings there, potentially three to $400,000 in the special ed subs. But we expect to fully expend all of our regular ed sub money because our expenses there are trending pretty high. Again, we have not analyzed all of the categories and all of the major accounts. So we're seeing some accounts coming in um, expected to be fully expended and other accounts we do anticipate having some savings but we don't have a total dollar amount yet on what some of those overages will be or what some of the savings will be because your student population this year is as of september 30 it was 14 946 or 949 something like that right, right. the september number was was 500 maybe less to, or or more than September of 2019. The, um, <clears throat> our, our December count was more like um, uh, 15,200. So from September to December, that number jumped uh, a couple of hundred. What is the date of the, um, when the state assesses how many students you have? What was that date again? September 30. September 30. And that was 14,000 what at September 30? 14,949.25. So if you have X amount of students as of September 30th, 
no matter how many people drop out after that, you still get that funding for that amount of students as of September 30th? Well, actually, because of COVID and the impact on enrollment, the state is using the greater of either your September 30 count or the three-year moving average. They're using the three-year moving average for us, which takes into account September of this year. It ignores September 30 of 2020, and then it looks at September 30 of the two preceding years. So that rolling average is 15,333 students, and that's what they're applying for our state aid for fiscal year 23. So, and that's what your budget was built on, 15,200 students. As of September 30th in 2019-18, and as, as of September 30th, 2021, there were 14,900. So using that as a basis for the calculations, your 300 students under that we paid for at, uh, what is the number, $8,000 per student. So that's $2.5 million dollars in my rough calculations. Um, so I understand that we only gave you a dollar over, which is what you asked for, right. but that was also based on a higher student count than you were anticipating at right. that time. Right, there was a no-fault, <clears throat> right. uh, hold harmless, they called right. it, right. Uh, last year requirement from the state mm -hmm. that you get no, that you fund it no less than uh, the FY19. Mm -hmm. Um, we have to um, keep in mind, too, we, we have some unknown territory coming up that is called the blueprint that uh, is going to have some huge expenses in the future. Um, what, one of the things uh, that we do uh, annually with our enrollment is we, we pretty much staff schools based upon enrollment, and that is if a school typically has um, <clears throat> Let's say uh, typically they have 100 fourth graders, and we'd say, okay, 25 in a class, that's four fourth grade teachers your school gets. If the enrollment goes down to 75, we say now you get three fourth grade teachers. We're taking one position away from that school. So we do that give and take all the way through August as the enrollment uh, hardens, and then once school starts, that's pretty much how we staff uh, schools. The same for the high schools. We have a number we use for staffing high schools. In the end, we began this year with about uh, with about nine or ten fewer regular classroom teachers doing it, that process, but then we added virtual school, and we assigned permanent teachers to virtual school, not really knowing how many uh, we would get in virtual school, and we ended up with about 11 teaching positions, uh, teaching uh, in the virtual uh, school realm uh, that we didn't have before. Not to mention you're short some counselors from what I heard at the meeting the other day. Yes, uh, well, we continue to have requests for more counselors. So there's, they request that you have one counselor per 250 students, is that correct? That is, uh, from what I understand, that is the recommended guidance from the, the National Guidance Counselors Association. We don't have that ratio in any of our now, schools. Now, in some schools, it's as many as 427 all of our, students. Yeah, all of our elementary, mo almost all of our elementaries just have one counselor. Yeah. And that's 500 kids. That's at crazy. The, at the, <laughs> uh, all of our high schools have typically had four guidance counselors, even though, um, uh, uh, so for Patuxent High School, that comes out to that ratio. Uh, we added two guidance counselors last year or two years ago, I think it was, for uh, the two largest high schools, Huntingtown High and Northern High. Uh, that makes five for almost 1,500 kids. Do you think one guidance counselor in high school, one guidance counselor can give the one-on-one -on -one need for 250 students? Um, uh, sure, certainly, that's the, if one guidance counselor for 250 is the, is the recommended ratio from the National Association, it must be presumed they can get the job done. We've been typically, like I said, more like at the high school level, more like at 300 and 350. Right. Uh, uh, but we have also have to point out that over the last few years, we have added a lot more staff positions for social, emotional, and psychological assistance. We've added uh, five school psychologist positions. We've added, uh, included funding to hire uh, in, um, interns in school psychology who have to do a year of internship. We have added a number of social workers. All of those can help 
uh, contribute to easing the load that might have typically fallen on the school council. So, Edie, do you know the current vacancy rate for employment for the school system? No, I don't know the vacancy rate. Do you track that? Do you track that? You must know I how many don't. unfilled. HR tracks vacancies. I look at it strictly for budgeting purposes, mm -hmm. but only to the extent that we make sure we have enough money in the budget to fund the salaries when those positions are filled. Right. But your budget contains enough money in the start of the year to fund every position that's approved. Yes. So if your vacancy rate, that is a budget issue. I mean, I understand well, HR Well, the, the vacancy that. doesn't mean that no one's in the seat. Somebody's in the seat. In other words, we have a vacancy right now perhaps for a math teacher at a certain school mm -hmm. because somebody left last week. Mm -hmm. There's a substitute in there, at least. So we, we have a lesser cost and we seek to find someone qualified to fill it as soon as possible. So a vacancy uh, doesn't mean there's no money expended. It means it might be a lesser qualified person in the position until such time as we can fill it. So how do you budget for substitute teachers if that's, you must have some kind of a track record or factor that you use to budget for substitutes. So for fiscal year 23, we pulled data total sub hours for regular ed and special ed subs from fiscal year 19, since that was our last full fiscal year. And we multiplied those hours by the current sub rates, which recently increased in December to help us to secure sub teachers. And that's how we budgeted for our regular ed and special ed substitute teachers for next year. So currently, how is that working in your budget? Are you on schedule or are you behind or ahead in that fund category? So as I shared with you earlier, currently we project that we're going to spend all of the regular ed substitute teacher funding, mm -hmm. but we are not utilizing special ed subs the way we historically have. So we are looking at potentially having three to four hundred thousand dollars of savings for special education sub teacher subs for this year. Right. So for those teacher short vacancies that's already accounted for in the substitute category. So if you're not over in the substitute category, then any of those vacancies in teaching positions are savings, correct? There would be savings in teacher salaries um, once we pay out whatever somebody has earned for the fiscal year. There might potentially be some savings there, right, for those positions when they turn over. And I, I, I'm, I'm guessing there are always teacher vacancies that sort of factor into your budget anyway, I would assume. All of the vacancies factor in. Teacher vacancies aren't the only vacancies we have. We have building service worker vacancies. We experience constant turnover throughout our district right. with all of our positions. I was just trying to, in my head, the, for the substitutes, because you need a substitute whenever there's a teacher vacancy, trying to, in my head, just balance those two budget yeah. items. And it's, it, it is certainly part of our, <clears throat> our work. We have more than 2,000 employees, and you're always going to have some vacancies, some long-term, mm -hmm. some short-term. I mean, you also have those who, who are off, off for leave, and they're fully paid while we're also paying for a sub. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have any way of predicting uh, some of those. This year we had to increase our compensation for subs. We, we would typically maybe have days where we would have a request for, um, uh, for let's say, 150 teacher subs, and we might be able to find 110. So if you don't have the subs, what's next? We call on people in the school to give up their planning period to cover one class. And that's additional cost that's difficult to figure out how to budget for it either, yep. uh, just as well. So we have new expenses there, uh, paying staff who are already there, uh, to give up their planning period to cover someone else. And one other thing is that with turnover, sometimes we see savings because a more experienced person higher on up on the pay scale leaves and is replaced by a less experienced person. Sometimes it works the other way. Sometimes we have a newer person, maybe even a provisional person who leaves, and they're replaced by a more experienced person. So it toggles back and forth in terms of where we are with having savings or paying more than we budgeted for individuals. And there's also certain positions that you have to give sign-in bonuses, too. 
Yes. To, in order to get them. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then in the case of our 12-month staff, when they leave, we have to pay out their annual leave. So there's an added expense with our 12-month staff that we don't have with 10- and 11-month staff. But you have that all the time, right? So that's factored in to your budget. The best I mean, that's can, not new to this best year. That's predicted, yes. Yeah. So yeah. You, not new, but the turnover is higher. Uh, so we are seeing so it's above trend. higher annually payouts this year. Typically, our big payout is in the summer when folks retire. Um, that's our big payout. But we're seeing continual payouts during the course of this year. So we're monitoring that account because it looks like we're going to overspend that account. Gotcha. I just want to add um, um, bonus. This isn't exactly a bonus, but what once, something we started about five years ago was Grow Your Own Teachers, where we've offered students, our, our high school graduates who have been part of the TAM program, if they agree to come back and teach for us and are difficult to fill positions, we'll give them um, uh, $3,000 each year for their college education as long as they promise to come back uh, to teach for us. And I think this year we have about five ready to exit and join us next year. And over the next two years, I think we, ha we have almost a total of six math teachers, which are uh, real rarities, <clears throat> who are own, our own uh, high school graduates who are going to come home to teach. It's a great program. We're excited about yeah. that. Great program. And you're still experiencing issues finding mental health positions yeah the uh, school psychologist I think we have budget typically we've we've said we would we have nine, 19 positions for school psychologists typically maybe we end up with 11 or 12 and the rest have to be contractors contractors so but you fill those through contractors you don't have vacancies right correct to meet the needs correct and because correct. of our past trends like currently we have nine vacancies for psychologists so because of that, that trend that's been going on for several years for fiscal year 23, instead of budgeting all of that money in salaries, we actually budgeted most of that in contracted services to cut down on the request to do the intercategory budget transfers for that. Gotcha. Yeah, because I was going to say, they actually came to the transfer for that with us. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yes, sir. Good morning, uh, Mark Willis, County Administrator. You know what, this, this session here was truly in a, in a good faith effort to just understand the accounting behind it. I would point out a, a couple of differences, though. The examples that you, you gave, Dr. Curry, were great examples. I think everybody here remembers them. The difference between those examples and this example is that you had bus drivers on strike. The commissioners had to account for that money with the board in good faith, and you heard the president say it's in good faith. Uh, but it was a unique situation where we had to come up, we had to agree to it, one, whatever that 50% was, we had to agree to it within about an hour. And it puts pressure on the board because they don't hear that the school board won't do it. They hear that they won't do it, that they won't make it happen, and, and that's part of it. So, you know, I would say that when you, when you admit to that 1.3 million and then we, we hear another nine, and we're not saying the nine isn't realistic, it's just a lot of money. So the, the true accounting understanding is, is really why we're here. I think that every effort's gonna be made to, to make that happen. But in fairness to the commissioners, it was a unique situation for them, and we're gonna find a way to make it work. So we appreciate you coming in. And look, for us, it's just doing our financial due diligence uh, I understand in the past it's never happened, uh, but, you know, if, we, if you came in here today and said we don't have any money, we'd cover the 2.6. You know, we're going to take care oh, of, okay. <laughs> we're going to take care of your employees. They just gave Sharon a heart attack. <laughs> but having said that, at the end of the year, if you came up with a surplus of $5 million, we wouldn't have much fun in your next year's budget <laughs> as a warning. Mm -hmm. So our only intent here today was to have you in, get an update on where you are in your budget, just to make sure that, you know, at the end of the year, you're not showing another $10 million surplus. And, uh, but we're going to honor our responsibility for sure. And like I said, if you came in here today and said you didn't, we do whatever needs to be done because those drivers had to be taken care of. I, I appreciate that. And certainly what we ended up doing in Calvary County was, uh, I like to think it led the way for the rest of the state, uh, uh, solidifying a, a living wage for school bus drivers uh, and led to a significant increase in our
budget request for next fiscal year, and, uh, along with other things that cause costs to go up. And um, given inflation the way it is today, um, boy, who knows what the future is going to, going to bring. I understand you guys get called about lots of school stuff that they want you to fix. And I don't mind if you just say, sorry, that's not our game that you call Curry. I don't mind it at all. And I some, sometimes usually what I do. say. <laughs> sometimes you do. I didn't run for a Board of Education. <laughs> that's right. So most of those previous deals you, you talked about before, I was on the Board of Ed. And in and, and, and my 30 years, 20 years of living down here, the Board of Ed has always, uh, the county commissioners have always funded the Board of Ed pretty well for what they've needed. And a lot of those deals for safety where the previous board came up with the two million that was huge it was it was it huge was. so now i'm over here so i got a sense <laughs> of this so i want to continue doing what previous boards have done well, we also. appreciate your support we appreciate uh, the previous years where we were funded above maintenance of effort with uh, with a, a, a little boost and uh, uh, that was uh, something that a lot of my colleagues can't count on like we can here so we appreciate your support and when I come to your board meetings, I'm just I'm just coming to hear. I know everybody's like, "What's he doing here? What's he doing here?" You know, so I'm not there to. You wear a disguise next. Time. Yeah, right, right. You don't sign up to speak. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, where, where are we? There were other items on the uh, bus drivers list that were deferred. So where are we at in negotiating negotiating those other items? So for fiscal year 23, we factored increases based on the CPI factor for the Washington Arlington Alexandria CPI index. That is four and a half percent. Um, what were some of the others? Health insurance. Health insurance. We actually did a 20 percent increase in what we're funding for the benefits trust for health insurance for next year which is pretty significant. That's almost a half million dollar cost just for the health insurance trust. Um, standard PBA increases, but again, the increases for the per vehicle allotment, increases for the temp route fees and all of those other fees are based on CPI, four and a half percent. Health insurance was the only increase that was based on a much higher um, rate. And that was based upon information that we received from an actuary. But the in driver pay rates, those increases were based on CPI as well. And the fuel rate is based upon? That's just based on the um, federal index of what the estimated uh, diesel rate is going to be for that, that period, that time frame. So have you made adjustments in the fuel allotment? Are you asking about the m and the maintenance and operations factor? Yes. yes. Not yet. Because we currently fuel. have the second highest in the state, and the legislative auditors have told us that we cannot justify the rate that we're paying. And so our plan is to meet with contractors to come up with a formula that justifies the rate that we're paying. And we've seen where two other counties have since adopted the same m and rate that we're paying. They were behind us, and now they're paying the exact same rate that we are. Because those of us that buy fuel and operate trucks, it's just... Well, it's like everything. It's just crazy. I mean, tires, fuel, I mean, down to oil. It's just crazy. Well, the fuel component is based upon what the cost of fuel is currently throughout the year. So we budget based on what is projected, but we pay based on what the actual fuel costs okay. are. But the so M &O you're sort of factor, accounting for that so on the go? We, we, we every two weeks. Every, every two weeks? Every two weeks? Okay. All right, that's what I was looking for. Yes. It's always moving. It's not based upon this year's prices. Gotcha. Right. Because fuel, I mean, it jumped 20 cents last week. So right. I didn't track diesel, but. But that know. per mile payment has two components, one being fuel and then the other being the maintenance and operations factor. Right. The teachers, uh, I mean, teachers, guess. the bus drivers, weren't they also asking about signing bonuses or longevity bonuses or was Initially, that Initially, yes, they were. Okay. But now That's that we have the, the highest table? rate in the state, we don't see that there's a need for that. Okay. It's my understanding that we've actually hired some drivers who left us and went other places and came back. So, are, are you guys still in negotiations with them on anything else, or did I hear they're getting health insurance now? Did I hear that correctly? They always had health insurance, but we increased the rate that we're paying. We pay a rate 
per route. Uh -huh. So we were paying $2,700 per route, regardless of whether the driver took the coverage or not. We are now budgeting to pay $3,250 per route for next year. Okay. So you don't actually provide them the product. You're just giving them money so they can purchase the product anywhere they'd like. They have a third-party vendor, okay. Okay. and so we send the money to the vendor for the trust, and they pay the money out to their health insurance provider. Gotcha. It's up to them but, to determine. But what's exactly guaranteed? What what's guaranteed that the contractor is going to provide that to the employee, the bus driver? Well, we the bus pay drivers. the money directly yeah, the drivers. to the trust. <laughs> That's yeah. what worries me. Well. No, we pay it directly to the trust, and then it's my understanding that just like our employees have a premium deducted from their pay, the drivers have premiums, their share of the premium deducted from their pay, and that is sent to the trust by the contractors. Okay. Yeah, certainly that, that, que that question is relevant, and sometimes it comes up, like from yeah. legislative audit and stuff like that, right. things like that, who say, well, how do you know? Uh, they say they need this <clears throat> for operations, and, and that is one of the unique things about how we do contracting here in Maryland is that they're contractors, but they're not really contractors who bid on a job like every right. other job thing we we contract some. We contract with anybody else for any other job. We don't know what they pay their employees. We don't know the benefits. Mm -hmm. Get this job done for us at this price. Right. This is just a unique thing. In the state of Maryland, where we have all these different pieces, where we have local business men and women who are dependent upon this, multi-generational businesses, and uh, so it, it makes for some awkward times. Um, just we, we don't audit their books. They agree to pay drivers at certain levels. We don't have a way to audit their private entities. Mm -hmm. we, so there's a, a matter of trust there. But, but your contract specifies funds you're given the contractor to pay his driver so if, if if the contractor didn't pay the driver what was specified in the contract isn't he negligent on his contract and wouldn't the employee have a case mr. county attorney be up to the employee bring it I'm just you know I, I'm just I, I guess what I'm getting at is the contractor doesn't have uh, the ability to pay less than what's allocated in the contract. He could pay more if he wanted to, but it would come out of his pocket. But if you all set the rate for the driver, that contract with, with the contractor requires him to pay that driver that, doesn't it, Mr. Attorney? I, uh, John Norris, County Attorney. Um, Mr. President, we're not privy to what those contracts are, either between the Board of Education and the bus contractors or between the bus contractors and their whether they're employees or, or subcontractors, the drivers. Uh, so we'd need to look specifically at those agreements to be able to answer that question. Yeah. I mean, if the contractor held back, the driver's going to leave, I would assume, because they know what you've allocated, they hear. And so if a contractor was pocketing some of the driver's money, I assume that wouldn't hold up very well with the employee. I think so. Yes. Yeah, so. I guess, and then my other question was, what's our current vacancy for bus drivers? Have we fixed that? I think we have about six, currently six vacancies. We, um, in a normal year, have 152 routes. Mm -hmm. And at last count, we have 146 buses back on the road. So mm -hmm. we're currently at about six vacancies. Is that kind of normal? Or, I mean, I assume there's always... Well, no, it's still, no? It's still not, normal. not normal. And uh, on the one hand, there's vacancies in that. Are there... <clears throat> How many buses do we have on the road? Right. The other is vacancies where someone quits today, and did we have someone on deck ready to fill it tomorrow? Right. And, I assume uh, that always happens. Yeah. Uh, we have had a whole lot more depth in past years than we have had this year. Mm -hmm. So it could be that a bus driver who is ill may not, that bus may not run, mm -hmm. where that hasn't necessarily been the way it would be in years past. There's been a pretty good depth of subs, even if it is uh, the owner of the business who, who doesn't typically drive, jumps in the seat. Mm -hmm. And we can't say enough for our transportation department staff, who we pay, probably five of them or six of them have spent many days starting out on a bus, mm -hmm. either as a driver 
or as a bus assistant mm -hmm. and ended their day mm -hmm. on a bus doing their regular work in between. I can't say enough about how much they have, extra hours they have put in to do that. And we have, we have paid the support staff who have had to do that for their extra hours. But our administrators who do that uh, don't get anything extra. So I just want to thank them, yep. Ed Cassidy and Kevin Hook, for all that they've done. We appreciate that. Questions? So just to reiterate, so everybody knows we're agreeing to pay for half of the the money for the the bus. Appreciate that. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank you. Right, we need a motion to do that. So commissioners, uh, <laughs> Sharon Strand, director of finance and budget, I'll bring a memo back to you all. We'll have to have a public hearing and do a budget adjustment that'll have to be duly advertised. So I'll be bringing that back to you all for your approval. Okay. Thank you. Sir, just a quick question. You know what the question is. <laughs> You're uh, here. Yeah, so let's go ahead and play this game. Go ahead. <laughs> has, the, uh, has the Board of Education rescinded their 10-person limit, 10-person uh, public comment limit yet? They have not. Will you please let them know that I and we would like to see them revisit that? They do Thank every you. meeting. Yep. Yes. And every single meeting it gets revisited. And uh -huh. hopefully one day one person is going to change your mind. Because right. in this environment, one person can and will make a difference. There you go. Thank you. And I will say I attended the last meeting and there were two speakers, I believe. Uh -huh. yep. Yeah. Two or three. All so the, more so the limit be, is pointless. Right. All, all, the, all the more reason why the limit is pointless. Mm -hmm. so, well, we appreciate you coming in. And uh, we were not trying to get, as I reiterate, we were not trying to get out of our end of the deal. We just... You know, we're just trying to do our financial due diligence and uh, make well, sure. Once that again, we, we appreciate you coming through mm -hmm. uh, at that time and helping with that cost. And we all we all got a little credit for settling. Well, it was just like we got blamed for, or maybe I got blamed for, <laughs> for being there. Got to take the credit and take the blame. Mm -hmm. That's, That's how it works. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to people's kids, we're all responsible. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So well, thank you both for coming thank in. You. Thank you. Thank this you. Time. Next item on the agenda is a presentation from the Office of the County Administrator. Good morning, Commissioners. Linda Vassallo, Deputy County Administrator. Um, Dr. Scott Kanaki, who is here with us this morning, he's the, the Director of the Patuxent Environmental and Aquatic Research Lab with Morgan State University in St. Leonard, is here to provide you an annual update and overview of the current research programs um, at the facility. And Scott, I'm going to turn it over to you. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here today. And I'm excited to talk about all the great things that we're doing at the Morgan State uh, Patuxent Environmental and Aquatic Research Laboratory. There's the overhead shot. Um, you, you all, of course, are familiar with Jefferson Patterson Park and, um, you know, very blessed to be able to work at such a, a just a gorgeous location. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can go to the next slide, or uh, I can do this here with, if this works. There we go. So I kind of feel like it's um, appropriate to just give some folks some background, just a reminder of the rich history of this laboratory. It wasn't always part of Morgan State University, and, in fact, it wasn't always uh, in Calvert County. It, it's, the lab started in 1967. Uh, it was upriver at that time, across the river in Benedict, and it was founded by the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. Uh, moved downriver into Calvert County in, in 1994 uh, to its present location in Jefferson Patterson Park, then became part of Morgan State University in 2004. So that's a little bit of the history, and just on the, on the right side of that, um, the screen there you can see some of the uh, you know, the infrastructure that we have we have a large three-story uh, laboratory and office building a fleet of research vessels a deep water pier you can see that in the, the lower left there that image uh, an oyster hatchery wet labs dry labs education rooms etc uh, and we're growing it's it's just very exciting times right now at the Morgan Pearl 
we're, we're fairly modest size in terms of the amount of uh, state funded personnel there. Uh, six total, myself, uh, three other PhD uh, scientists, and, and then, um, well, we have uh, two support staff currently. We're looking to add another one as well. But what's really exciting is the amount of graduate students that we're, we're supporting, undergraduate research technicians. Uh, in fact, I'd even describe us as having some modest uh, growing pains with the amount of students that we've taken on and that we're supporting. So I'll keep moving here. So when I describe what the Morgan Pearl does, I, I typically describe it as having four core areas. Three of those areas are research. I'll, I'll start there. Uh, the name, Mo the Pearl, is, is quite appropriate. We focus a lot on oysters. Uh, of course, the eastern oyster doesn't have pearls. That's another story. But uh, so aquaculture is a been a big part of the lab, particularly since 2008 when we built our oyster hatchery uh, in that lab from funds from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and there's our team right there. This program is led by Dr. Ming Liu, and he is working on well, several projects. One is to develop a new line of oysters that grows faster and has lower mortality in Maryland's uh, low salinity waterways. So that's a big challenge for oyster farmers in the uh, upper part of the Chesapeake Bay. So we're looking to develop, he's developing a line of low salinity tolerant oysters. Um, and that's funded by Maryland Sea Grant. Another recent Maryland Sea Grant project that he's begun uh, is soft shell clams. So there is a pro uh, product diversity challenge in the aquaculture industry. Soft shell clams um, are harvested by wild fishers, of course, uh, wild harvesters. However, there is potential to um, create a, um, a farm product as well. There are some challenges that need to be resolved in terms of how you're going to grow soft shell clams and what types of cages. They like to have sediment around them. That's how they live in the wild, where they're kind of condensed and protected. So we have um, uh, funding from Maryland Sea Grant to, ex to develop uh, innovative new ways to farm soft shell clams. So that really could be a um, you know, game changer. Uh, I don't know if that's too strong or not, but it, we'll see how the research uh, progresses there. So secondly, coastal ecology. Coastal ecology is the, and environmental monitoring, that's been the lifeblood of our laboratory since the laboratory started in 1967, trying to understand the impacts of power plants coming on, coming online in the area back in the 60s and, and early 70s. Um, and that continues today with a modern twist, looking at uh, developing ecological models. We've done that for oyster reef restoration in the Choptank River, linking those uh, changes in the ecosystem from the restoration to changes in economic impacts uh, as it relates to potential increases in a particularly blue crab harvest from oyster restoration. Just got another uh, tranche of funds from NOAA to explore oyster restoration in Virginia. So that's a program that's, uh, there's kind of like the good and the bad where we're expanding on the ecological uh, modeling side, but the long-term monitoring, which was, the lab has done so much of that and we continue to do it here and there, that's become more difficult to fund when you get, you know, doing something 30, 40, 50 years. And sometimes it just becomes challenging to uh, convince folks that it's important to continue this frankly, into perpetuity. <laughs> uh, that, that can be a difficult pitch. They pro you, know, you go to National Science Foundation and NOAA, those projects are a couple years. But we want to keep doing blue crab monitoring, for example, into perpetuity. And that actually is somewhere where we're struggling to find some level of funding to continue that important work. And that work, yeah, started in 1967 in our lab, um, studying blue crabs in the Chesapeake Bay. So. Um, environmental economics. Uh, I, as well as being the director, I lead this research uh, program as well. I'm an environmental economist by training. Uh, my area of expertise uh, is, though I, I branch much broader than this now, uh, is outdoor recreation economics. 
how hunters and anglers and bird watchers and other folks make decisions and where to recreate, how often to recreate, how much money to spend, etc. So uh, that's an exciting part. Of course, you know, I'm biased and I'm an economist, but uh, we're doing different things than you might initially think of when you see a marine laboratory with the seawater system. So there's, uh, and this has been had explosive growth. I've, I've hired a full-time economist to work under me and we're just getting ready to advertise for another postdoc to support that work. Okay, and then finally, environmental education. Uh, and again, that's been a tricky thing uh, with Morgan State, the main campus being 80 miles north of where we're located. And we lack we rent a house from the park. It's not nearly sufficient, but we make do. Um, it's, uh, and we're making great strides uh, along these lines here. Um, and I'll talk a bit about our new degree program at Morgan State in coastal science and policy that I do think is a game changer in how the Morgan State Pearl engages with the academic infrastructure on campus. So again, growing the Morgan Pearl, these are some of the faces of graduate students and undergraduate students and, and postdocs who are supporting the work that we're doing. And uh, this wasn't something that the lab was doing a whole lot of six, seven years ago. But at this point right now, we serve as dissertation advisors for eight Morgan doctoral students. We're supporting them financially, uh, many of them. And we support undergraduate research technicians through our summer internship program right there. We typically have six to 10 interns every year. Uh, and with limited housing, four, four to five bedrooms, um, we uh, prioritize those rooms for Morgan State students that, are, that live in Baltimore. We always try to you know, find local students in Calvert County and Southern Maryland. They can, com they can commute into the lab and do work without needing a place to stay. Um, I'll take you through uh, some highlights and then some upcoming expectations and I'll wrap up and, I'm, and I'd love to hear any comments or questions you have. Uh, fiscal year 2021, which ended in July, this past July, uh, was, an, was just an epic year for, for the Morgan Pearl. Uh, $1.8 million for our, our modest size laboratory and external funds that were brought in. Uh, and that's more than we've had since at least 2010 in a single year. So super exciting. Um, a big chunk of that, a good chunk of that is uh, $1 million from the National Science Foundation to explore um, the prevalence of microplastics. Uh, you probably all have seen that in the news nowadays. And it's it's a hot research topic. We're sampling both in the Inner Harbor in Baltimore, the Patapsco River, as well as the Patuxent River to understand the prevalence of microplastics. Already some interesting findings there with, uh, in relation to microplastics and jellyfish and sea nettles. So, and then, yeah, and the, boat, the, the uh, Bachelors of Science in Coastal Science and Policy. When I became the director of the Pearl in, in 2017, that was my number one priority, is to develop a degree program that could connect us better to main campus and, as importantly, leverage the local connections down here with the College of Southern Maryland. And we've been working with them, developing articulation agreements. So that was approved in October of 2020, um, yeah, 2021 uh, by the Maryland Higher Education Commission. The program will go live this upcoming fall. We're in the process of developing curriculum for seven new courses. Uh, super exciting. The, the potential um, is just is so great there. And uh, with our partners in College of Southern Maryland, Anne Arundel, uh, PG, uh, there's a lot of great potential there. So, um, and then just expectations. Well, what, we're, what we hope for in 2022, um, Housing remains a serious challenge for us. The, the Morgan State Investment Committee uh, has expressed an interest in building a dormitory. When our, when our laboratory was built um, back in uh, yeah, 1994, they put in the schematics this additional wing that you would build on it for, for you know, just essentially a dorm. And uh, there's no funding at that point to build that, but we 
there is interest in Morgan State in, in supporting that to the tune perhaps of several million dollars. Uh, now that needs, we need to jump through different hoops with the park and the state, et cetera, of course. And <laughs> it's gonna be non-trivial, but the park is so supportive of our, of our work, Jefferson Patterson Park and Museum. We just got a great partnership with them and they're, they're very supportive, kind of broadly speaking right now. Um, so on the, on the right there, uh, there's a comprehensive oyster bill, uh, it's Senate Bill 830, that uh, would do a number of things to support oysters in the Bay. And I mean writ large, not just focused on restoration, focused on issues that watermen care about as well. Um, the Morgan Pearl um, is in that bill um, uh, to the tune of uh, $2.5 million to support infrastructure upgrades that would allow us to better support uh, oyster production uh, and, and contribute to restoration initiatives as well as just the public fishery as well. So uh, that's that that would be fantastic for our laboratory and I you know of course very much hope that that passes. Uh, that's sponsored by a bipartisan group of folks including Senator Alfrith and, and Senator Jack Bailey down here um, in Southern Maryland. Uh, and, and then finally, again, the Bachelors of Science in Coastal Science and Policy launching in, in fall of, uh, this fall, fall 2022. So again, it's been an honor. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, invite all of you to visit the, the laboratory uh, and, and come see what we're up to. And just glad to have the opportunity to talk about this right here with you all. So thank you. Yeah. So uh, do you partner up with any of our high school so that's something that, um, you know, because of COVID has been pretty limited, but we have a new education coordinator who uh, is exploring different partnerships and works, um, it's kind of develop, beginning to develop those. We have in the past substantially, uh, a, our former education person retired right before COVID hit, so the new person is, it's been a little bit of a challenge getting up and running with some of that, but yeah, it is something that we, we certainly do. Yeah, and uh, there's conversations ongoing there, yeah. Mm -hmm. I assume there would be a lot of interest. Yeah, yeah, no, no, there is. I'm blanking on a couple of the names, and our education coordinator is in contact with those folks. And as we're, fingers crossed, coming out of this, this the pandemic that we're in, uh, you know, there's just, and we're growing more talent perhaps as well, and finding ways to live with it. Um, there's, there's just great opportunities, and we're pursuing them, yeah. The big main house is sitting there empty. You could put your students in there. Oh, that big brick house, yeah, the uh, the, the Patterson building there. Yeah, yeah I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't suggested that. See, that's a great idea. I'll, I'll make sure to talk to the park director immediately following this. He's going, isn't <laughs> meeting. he? Oh, who, the, the old? Greg. He's what? Greg is going. I hope there's not this information that you know that. Uh, I got an email. He's leaving. Is that? Is that right? Mm -hmm. I tell you, I work with him. I mean, taught to him bi-weekly, uh, well, twice a week at least. Uh, he's kept that under wraps with me. Twice. That's something. Yeah. Well, that, I'm, he's only been there like three or four years. I know, right? And he came from Colorado. Came, yeah, Wyoming, I believe, right? Somewhere or was Colorado? There. Yeah, yeah. Wyoming. Yeah. He yeah. lives in my neighborhood, actually, in the Emerald Cove HOA. He's a neighbor of mine. So you live in Emerald Cove? Yeah. I live on Hanch Road. Oh, okay. All right. You didn't get my permission to drive in Hanch Road. Just, just <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that. I should come here. Yeah, that's interesting. He, I will say, the Greg has kind of gone a little bit dark, and I have been talking to Marika more. But yeah, I do too. Yeah, I, I think I've only talked to him twice. It's yeah, like yeah, that is that is something. Because she so. lives down there too. We're getting off the yeah. side of <laughs> where she lives. But uh, it, it would be great to see a partnership with the high schools. Okay. You know, because we're surrounded by mm -hmm. water, and you mm -hmm. know, uh, you're right here. And yeah. Yeah, I will talk to our education coordinator and, and state that that's uh, something that you're strongly encouraging. Just a re reminder of that. And I'm looking forward yeah. to coming back and giving you an update next year and all the, you know, kind of more specifically to that since you're asking specifically Understand about that. Understand the COVID prints and yeah. challenges mm -hmm. in the future moving forward. Yeah, for sure. It looks like it'd be a great opportunity for our kids yeah. right here in the neighborhood. Oh, absolutely. Agreed. How about the Marine Museum? you do any kind of coordination with them? <sighs> Let's see. What have we there hasn't nothing comes to mind immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the former 
acting director of the park, Rochelle, um, mm -hmm. who's the education person over there. Mm -hmm. We've tried to, we wrote, we wrote a proposal that was ultimately unsuccessful in which we would put oyster cages in their stingray tank to see like w whether or not like they prevented predation. I think it's actually related to soft shell clams now that I think about it because they're more easily predated, hence because of the soft shell, right? That it was not funded. So we've attempted to get a couple things going on that front with research, but yeah. So I've toured the facility a couple of times just because. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about the other gentlemen, but uh, uh -huh. if there were some oysters on the table, we'd probably be up for a tour. I, I <laughs> love it. Great. We, I, I certainly can make that happen. Yeah. yeah. So tell Marika you need the big house. Yeah, I'll, 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 let, I'll pass on the information, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Empty, so. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's funny. I've never never suggested and I even tongue-in-cheek, but I could, yeah. uh, <laughs> I could But do you that. do have a nice facility there. Thank you. And, uh, if, this, if this Senate bill comes to fruition and becomes law, then you know substantial upgrades would be on the on the on the, on the cards as well. Yeah. So. Well, we appreciate you coming in, and you're always welcome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. I really appreciate it. I did this remotely last year, and it's nice to see you all in person and talk in person. It's a little better. In person. Get dressed up a little bit, right? <laughs> little bit. I won't be dressed like this on the farm. <laughs> all right. Well, thank all you. Right, thank you very thank much. Thank you, yep. sir. Mm -hmm. Next item on the agenda is proclamations. It's National Engineers Week. Would that be Commissioner Weems? It would be, sir. Great. And, and doctor, if you need a, a lobbyist for permission to drive down Hans Road, you <laughs> contact me, sir. I'll be in touch. Okay. All right. Advocate. Thank you, We have a couple members of the gallery. We have uh, Professor Byron. Please come forward and, and student Jordan Riggs. And um, please come up. Welcome to you both, gentlemen. Whereas engineers use their scientific skills and specialized knowledge in creative and innovative ways to fulfill society's needs. And whereas engineers help solve major technological challenges from designing efficient building systems to rebuilding towns devastated by natural disasters. And whereas engineering has been called the invisible or stealth profession because items we use every day have been engineered in some way. Although we may not know much about engineering or see the engineering behind the scenes. And whereas founded in 1951, National Engineers Week, E-Week, is dedicated to ensuring a diverse and well-educated future engineering workforce by increasing understanding of and interest in engineering and technology careers. And whereas E-Week is a formal coalition of more than 70 engineering, education, and cultural societies with more than 50 corporations and government agencies dedicated to raising public awareness of engineers' positive contributions to our quality of life. And whereas E-Week promotes recognition among parents, teachers, and students of the importance of technical education and a high level of math, science, and technological literacy, and motivates youth to pursue engineering careers in order to provide a diverse and vigorous engineering workforce. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Calvert County that the week of February 20th through the 26th, 2022, be known as National Engineers Week. Be it further proclaimed that we urge all citizens to join in recognizing the important contributions of engineers to our daily lives, given under our hands and seal this 15th day of February, 2022. Congratulations, gentlemen. May we get a photograph?
here you got the TV on. Very brief. Okay. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I just want to uh, thank you on behalf of the College of Southern Maryland and the engineering community. Uh, we managed to come out of stealth mode today to be here, and now we're going to go back to our invisibility and our stealthiness. Uh, really appreciate it. Young man, you want to say anything? Thank you. No? Just, just thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate the recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Y'all you. have a great day. Thank you all very much. item on the agenda is another proclamation for nat national entrepreneurship. Uh, Commissioner Gadway. Miss Rosanna and Miss Bonnie, would you guys like to come up? Good morning, ladies. Good morning. We'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. And who yourselves. else do we have here? Barbara Buchanan. Pleasure. Thank you for coming. This is Entrepreneurship Week, and if it weren't for entrepreneurs in our country, we would be missing so many things, so many inventions, so many jobs. Entrepreneurs are the backbone of our country, and it's greatly appreciated for everything that they bring. So whereas the week of February 12th to the 19th, 2022, has been des designated National Entrepreneurship Week, and whereas entrepreneurship is vital to Calvert County's growth and prosperity, and whereas most of the new jobs created throughout the United States in the past decade have come from the creative efforts of entrepreneurships and small business, and whereas local entrepreneurs serve as models of success to others in the community because their success demonstrates an opportunity for all others. And whereas the United States House of Representatives resolved to recognize the first annual National Entrepreneurship Week commencing on February 24, 2007. And whereas Calvert County recognizes and supports entrepreneurship as an economic equalizer crucial to the long-term growth of local communities, the state, and the nation. National Entre Entrepreneurship Week provides Calvert County an opportunity to celebrate and support entrepreneurs within our community. Now, therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Calvert County that the week of February 12th through the 19th, 2022, be known as Entrepreneurship Week in Calvert County. Be it further proclaimed that we encourage all citizens to be mindful of the role that small businesses play in their lives. Not on here. Please shop local. Please treat your local businesses. Uh, signed by the county commissioners. Given under our hands and seal this 15th day of February 2022. Thank you. just want to say thank you and it's an honor and uh, our entrepreneurs in Calvert County work together we uh, represent I personally represent uh, along with Reverend Barbara the Calvert County Minority Business Alliance and we partner with uh, the Calvert County uh, Chamber of Commerce and the Southern Maryland uh, Minority Chamber and uh, we thank you very much for this and appreciate the honor Hi, I'm Bonnie Barrett, and I'm here representing the Calvert County Chamber of Commerce. And I want to thank everybody today for this great proclamation. And I want to thank all of you for being such wonderful entrepreneurs as well. That should not go unnoticed. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Th
Thanks. Have a good day. So the next item on the agenda is old business, the Police Accountability Board and Administrative Charging Committee. Mr. Norse, County Attorney. Good morning, Commissioners. I asked Melanie Woodson to please join me today. Because Melanie's the Director of Human Resources, and Human Resources will take over the staffing of the Accountability Board once it is presented. So I will read the memo. By 2021, laws of Maryland Chapter 59, the Pol Maryland Police Accountability Act of 2021, the Board of County Commissioners is required to stand up a police accountability board and an administrative charging committee. The act repeals the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights and makes other substantial and substantive changes to how the activities of law enforcement officers are reviewed, as well as how changes can be made to the institution of law enforcement. For the accountability board, the Board of County Commissioners must, one, establish the membership of the budget and the staffing for Police Accountability Board, two, address the appointment of a chair, three, establish procedures for record keeping by the PAB. That's PAB's charge is, among other things, to meet quarterly and report annually on what should be done to improve matters of policing. So that is, I think, one of the shortcomings of that session law is that the Police Accountability Board will report back to the Board of County Commissioners and because you don't have a police force, they trust that you will pass that message along to the sheriff who will then implement some of those changes, um, but there's no requirement. Each county must also have an administrative charging committee to serve as a countywide law enforcement agencies and local law enforcement agencies in the county. The county commissioners appoint only two of those five members of the charging committee with the police accountability chair or their designee serving on the charging committee and the police accountability board has two citizen appointments to the charging committee the principal function of the administrative charging committee is to consider evidence to determine if it's appropriate to administratively charge a police officer who is the subject of the investigation in the determination if the determination is made that charges are appropriate they recommend a penalty consistent with the disciplinary matrix approved by the state discussion this board gave direction to solicit public input on the performance of the county's obligations under the act. Commissioner Tim Hutchins aided in accelerating this process with a very detailed and well-reasoned first draft of a resolution that thoroughly addressed all of the county's obligations. Revisions were made based upon public input and further public comment was solicited and received on the second draft. Revisions based upon public comment created a public hearing document for further input, the purpose of this meeting is to review the record of the public hearing and, if appropriate, take action. Fiscal impact, indeterminable, but anticipated to be significant. Uh, if it's okay with the board, I'll come back to the conclusion and recommendation. I did want to address, there were a uh, number of comments that came in from the public uh, during the process of the public hearing uh, and subsequent to the public hearing. We could not have gotten this far without the participation of the Board of County Commissioners at all of those town hall meetings, the participation of the public and the input that the public has provided to the process. So it would be f fair to include the citizens as being one of the bodies that is served. When we look at the accountability board is to serve the, when we had said in their countywide law enforcement agencies, but we left out the citizens of Calvert County. So that is the first change I would like to ask that you consider is that the citizens be recognized as being served by the accountability board. The um, comments came in that immediate family members of law enforcement, whether they're active duty or have retired but within the last five years, that the immediate family members be treated the same as their spouse, their significant other, their parent, their grandparent, that they would be eligible for appointment if their law enforcement agency member had been retired for five years. So you couldn't have somebody who's active duty law enforcement and their spouse would be eligible for appointment to the accountability board. Uh, going further, uh, resignation and removal there were some comments that there was too much discretion of the Board of County Commissioners and you could remove someone based on their viewpoint based on their comments during an accountability board meeting or a charging committee meeting 
and it was recommended that the um, eligibility criteria be applied continuously so that the Board of County Commissioners could remove someone, one, if a majority of that charging committee or accountability board recommends it, or two, if that member no longer meets the criteria for appointment, the juror standards for appointment. So if they're convicted of a crime, if they plead nolo contendere or they plead uh, guilty to criminal charges that would make them ineligible for appointment, that would make them eligible for removal as well. And of course, there was some comment about the budget and how much the budget should be. Looking at the operating budget for the sheriff's office, it looks to be about 32 million. There were some comments that it should be a percentage of that. Um, staff recommended budget is coming forth to the public for review in March of this year. Uh, my recommendation is that that be part of the annual budget process. One, because it's a legislative act and you couldn't bind future boards to it anyway. But two, there is uh, much to look at with what might be the cost of this bill. It's not just the cost for the charging committee members time it's also the other costs that are incorporated the body camera that will be required to be purchased the backup for that storage the batteries everything else that goes along with implementing this so we worked uh, to address the confidentiality and we worked to address the issue of cooperation with criminal investigations in forming the conclusion and recommendation so staff requests a motion to close the record and adopt and enact the resolution. I'm told I missed something. No. Um, Staff is uh, request a motion to close the record and adopt and enact a resolution establishing the Calvert County Police Accountability Board and the Calvert County Administrative Charging Committee and direct that both the board and the committee work with the sheriff and the state's attorney to establish practices and procedures that maintain confidentiality and accomplish the objectives of each organization without interfering with the state's attorney's duty to enforce the criminal laws. And with that, I'll ask Melanie if she has any further comments. I do not have any further comments. Melanie Woodson, Human Resources Director. So moved. Or do you want me to reread it again? No. Okay. Second. So we have a motion and a second that we close the record and a draft a resolution to adopt. Any discussion on that motion? It's been a long time coming here. Thank you so much for all your hard work and efforts. I've been to a couple of the meetings. You've been to all of them. And fantastic job on getting this done. As we said, we couldn't have done it without the direction from the board on each of the drafts right. and also the members of the public that stayed engaged in this and truly were committed to coming up with a product that could meet the needs of our county. Yeah, we couldn't have done it without all the citizens that showed up for all those meetings and submitted comments because at the end of the day, the mission of this is to serve the citizens of Coward County. So, And uh, as far as the 1%, you know, we've made, I've made the comments, uh, we wish we could get away with only 1% of the sheriff's budget. I'm afraid it's going to be uh, much more significant than that. And uh, at the end of the day, we don't have a choice. We have to fund whatever is necessary to meet the state law requirements. So... Uh, but yeah, I think if we could get away with a hundred, a couple hundred thousand dollars, that I call that a good day. But I don't believe that's going to happen. So, uh, any other discussion? Just, just one comment. Uh, I encourage those interested in the uh, said committees to keep their eye out for the release of uh, the vacancies and the the standing up of the committees. We have kept a list of those who have expressed interest already, and they will receive notification. Um, the others, anybody else that's interested, uh, will be able 
to contact the commissioner's office and your appointment secretary will make sure they get a form to fill out. So what kind of timeline are we looking looking at for opening an application period? I would recommend that we could open applications as soon as today if uh, the board adopts this motion and we probably want to close it with the session law going into effect July 1 and with the amount of training that's going to be required at least for the charging committee to be able to perform their duties beginning on July 1 and that's training that's provided by the State Police Standards and Training Commission. Um, we would want to have those appointments done at the latest mid-March, early March. So, Melanie, that process is going to require the drafting of an application and publicizing the criteria, which you're estimate of when you have that ready to go John just said people can start applying today I just want to <laughs> well that was presuming we'd use the standard form to apply for your other and I guess my question that's my question to Mel we just we have an application that's ready to go for an individual to apply that if the standard application is what we intend to use then certainly we can get that published as quickly as possible um, but how would someone know right now what the criteria is? Is that posted online? It is actually on the Police Accountability Board in the draft resolution, the criteria that it... Okay. And then when somebody applies for it, what, what, who, who in our staff reviews those and makes the recommendations to us? The board, so we would have to work out the process to determine if they met the juror criteria before presenting the names to the county commissioners in open session for you to select who you might wish to appoint. So all names of anybody that applies to it will be, come before us? We would identify those that did not meet the criteria for juror. So those that had been uh, eligible for and convicted of a crime for which the period of incarceration was a year or more and had not been pardoned. Um, we would have to identify those who would not be eligible for appointment um, and presumably we'd want to keep their information confidential and not public I just I just think we should set a date for people to start applying and it is not today because I, I'm sure Melanie's going to need a little bit of time to get squared away and make sure that we have all the information available I don't want people calling in and Getting the response, I don't know. It's my concern. So, well, if we well, hurry up and get her out of this meeting, she might get it done. <laughs> if, uh, you know, you know, John was being generous saying today, but I know that doesn't really happen that fast. So that's why I'm kind of looking at you, Melanie. Uh, if we were to try to do that today to set a date, what would be appropriate? So I think it would be fair to staff to um, establish a deadline of two weeks from today to be able to get something published. Is that reasonable to the board? Whatever you say you need. I mean, so okay. well, well, first of March was mid March. Um, from what I'm hearing, we're way ahead of everybody else. So and let's keep it that way. What I've what I've heard, I think St. Mary's is just getting ready to go to public hearing. So they could start applying March 1st? March 1st. We'll go with March 1st. Is that our conceptual? Yes. Shouldn't be. Is, that, I mean, enough everything time? is, is that enough time for you? To begin advertising and to get the application ready to be sent out, I would think. Good. Not enough time for people to have responded. No. I mean, we're gonna, no, that's just. I, I would push, I would give 30 days for people to submit their applications. Good. Super. Okay. I just didn't want to put HR in a box. Yeah. You have people Do you need more time, Mel? Yeah. If more time is needed, I will be sure to request that time from the board okay. well in advance. Okay. But we do, there is a time deadline for us, so we can't push too much. Understood. Yeah. 
because we're supposed to be up and running by July 1. And we've got to get the applicants in place and have them trained. And so, not that it's a rush, but March 1st is a... There's, wasn't there talks of that possibly being extended? Uh, there were talks of it, but There's no legislation in place to okay, do anything. No. Changing not one thing. Gotcha. So if we, uh, what's your normal timeline for applications? If it starts March 1st, what's the cutoff normally for you? So when we would receive a general application for employment, we usually use three weeks as a rule of thumb. March 21st. I'm just trying to get the process all squared away. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to put anybody on the spot. So if we close applications March 1st, You've got to vet those, and that process is not going to be too quick. Correct. I assume. What, what was your, what would be your vision of that process to get them vetted before they get to us? So I don't have a vision of that process quite yet, sir. <laughs> I, uh, I understand. Right. I understand. So certainly, um, I would have to do a lot of coordinating with communications and the county attorney and the county administrator to determine exactly what we want that process to look like. So I am definitely capable of receiving and soliciting applications within a three week time frame for sure. The review process, I cannot speak to that at this moment. Do you have an estimate? John? I, other than performing the background check to determine whether or not somebody has a disqualifying felony conviction. Um, I had not envisioned that there would be much staff input as to recommendations for the board. And we would identify those that meet the criteria of being, you know, a, a mental health professional, for example, and perhaps group them in that way so that the criteria could be considered. You want to make sure you've got representation from the three commissioner districts as they've now been reconstituted. You want to make sure that you don't have um, less than 50% of the board as, as women to match the demographic of the county. Um, so we would try to group them that way. I guess my, my um, thought is the background checks is I don't know how long they take because that's out of our control in, in, in a way. Is the background it's, check just simply going on MarylandJudiciary.com or it's more than that? Oh, it's more than that. Okay. Yes. And like Ooh. I said, I'm just running through the timeline and the clock's ticking. And mm -hmm. Do we have like a, a service that provides that? We do. They currently do our fingerprinting, but they can also do other work like that. Yes. Okay. So if we cut them off March 21st, if it takes two weeks to vet, and when I say vet, I mean it's just a matter of you all making sure that they meet the criteria. There's no point in us looking at applications that aren't going to, at the end of the day, qualify. Right. So. It's, we're, I mean, we're not asking you to say who should be on and who's not. We're not looking for a recommendation that says these nine people should be appointed. It's just to make sure they qualify. Yes. Commissioners, if I may. Yes, sir. Mark Willis, County Administrator. So within the County Administrator's Office, we have well over 50 boards and commissions that we already tend to. The process is going to be similar. may not be exactly the same in this case, but I think between my office and the office of uh, our uh, human resources uh, will be able to come up with a process that will be able to bring to the board recommendations of those individuals, not recommendations for one over the other, but uh, a list of individuals that meet the criteria and therefore are provided to the board to, to make a decision on filling those times, those slots based on the criteria, 50% women, for example. Uh, we'll, we'll do that. We'll figure that out, and as soon as we have a chance to sit down and do that, we'll come back to the commissioners long before the next Tuesday. And currently today, the training's not available. Correct. Um, but like I said, I was just working through the timeline in my head and making sure that, you know, I don't want to get us jammed up. But 
So for the public, the, the key dates are March 1st, there will be an application that's available. They can go to the county's website to get that application. We'll make sure it's posted on the Police Accountability Board page on the website by March 1st. And they will have until the 21st to return that application. Okay, so we would expect to see something in April, middle of April? I would, I would think. I, I would say yes, and the, the idea, too, is that once we start to receive those applications, we're not waiting to, until the 21st. Right. I mean, right. we're, we're doing that in advance. We're going to figure out the process to do it. As they come in, we're going to work on it. And then I, I think certainly in the, the middle of uh, April, we'll be able to pull something together and, and get on the agenda to brief the Board of County Commissioners. The challenge is going to be the 50% rule. You're going to have to have a half a man and half a woman. At least 50%. Got to lighten it up somehow. Yes. Okay, so uh, this is not really part of the yeah, motion that's that. on the table, but just discussion. So uh, the motion on the table is that we uh, close the record and we adopt the resolution to create the Police Accountability Board and the Charging Committee. Any other discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is consent and Department of Finance and Budget, Chesapeake Hills Golf Buzz Golf Course Budget Adjustment 167. Is there any objection to that item? Hearing none, that item will be adopted as presented. New business, item number one, Department of Parks and Recreation, Five Ponds Nature Park Filming Request. Director Nizal. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. It is still morning. Almost afternoon. <laughs> Okay, so the first one that I have for you, I'll go ahead and uh, read the memo. So the Flag Ponds Nature Park filming request, the background, Department of Parks and Recreation, was approached by Magilla Entertainment on using Flag Ponds Nature Park to produce an episode of a reality television show. The filming dates are requested to be March 9th and March 10th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and March 11th during park hours. Magilla Entertainment provided the Department of Parks and Recreation with general liability insurance, naming Calvert County additionally insured. Discussion, Magilla Entertainment has provided a location agreement and synopsis of the reality show content for review. The fiscal impact, Flag Ponds Nature Park is not open to the public on Wednesday and Thursday, March 9th and 10th, and would be a direct cost to the requester of $418.46. Conclusion, recommendation, staff recommends the Board of County Commissioners authorize the Board President to sign the location agreement allowing filming to take place at Flag Ponds Nature Park on March 9th, 10th, and 11th, and direct staff to whether the Board President must review and approve the film prior to it being made uh, available publicly. Thank you. Questions? Move to approve. Second. So I have a motion and a second that we, excuse me, pass a motion authorizing the board president to sign the location agreement and direct staff to whether the board president must review and approve. Well, wait, wait a minute. I know. So <laughs> I was going. My motion. It's a two part. <laughs> so the we need to have a discussion about whether I have to review the film. Uh, the, and the concern is for the public is that someone comes and creates a film. Uh, uh, makes the county look bad, uh, and that uh, what kind of oversight should we have? So that's the discussion before we get into a motion. Sorry. What was the other option? There was two, I thought. The other option is that we. Um, let me see. John knew what it was. What is it, John? I, it really is just do you want to review the film to make sure that it doesn't paint the county in a bad light? Or, or not it's it's so it's either just sign the agreement and allow it to happen or if we require a review a viewing yes so review. the motion on the floor is to do what Commissioner Weems? I know I need to either amend or or drop said motion according to Robert's rules correct sir um, 
I will uh, negate said motion and uh, ask the board for another motion. I will say, commissioners, that at this point, um, we have not received any filming requests that have put the county in a bad light. This may be, this may delay them from doing what they're doing too, right? They will likely not um, utilize Calvert County for, um, uh, or, or at least Flag Ponds Nature Park for their filming, if the county requires um, us to review prior to it release to the public. And this is just for um, county property, so they're still able to to film in other locations. Um, in the county so this is specifically for um, county property that this applies to which and the, is most of the time park property that they like to use the so agreement, the agreement lays out some requirements and guidelines right there can't be an illegal activity those kinds of items so there we should be covered in the agreement so the issue is when I think it's called sex in the city came back out there was an exercise bike that had given permission to be used in that film. That exercise bike was the scene of a heart attack for an individual, so it affected their stock significantly. Mm -hmm. um, that would not be prevented by the agreement that you're being asked to sign, but frankly, if people were going to try and paint Calvert County in bad light, would they come to us with a filming agreement and release probably not so it was an issue that was raised previously when Commissioner Hutchins was here it was required at that time I don't know whether that's a practice the board wants to continue or not gentlemen quick question did I hear you correctly that they can go and film anywhere else in the county on public parks without this approval or with not this not on not with uh, not on county property not on park property no okay it's specific to flag ponds well this right. this particular like so any um organization that comes to us with the filming request at a park location at this time every single request comes to the board of um board of commissioners and but it doesn't apply to anything that someone wants to do on their private property or um or another on state park property that they would have to get permission from the state for those purposes. So this uh, is this request particularly is for Flag Ponds Nature Park, but the second part of that is uh, for any request. So that way, uh, in regards to if we get other requests in the future, does the board want to be able to review those prior to going out to the public? <laughs> I wasn't here when some of the other things happened in the past, like the TV show Speeders and something else. Were th just for my education, did the board or anyone have to approve all of that footage before it went out? I think Live PD was another one, and some of the others. Or was that just that carte was, blanche, whatever? That was directly through the sheriff's department. I'm sorry, Commissioner Linda Vasallo. That agreement was not with the commissioners. It was with the Sheriff's Department. We were not aware that that was happening prior. Okay, because I can see where some of those um, painted in an interesting light in Calvert County would come from. That's why I wanted to find out if that was part of that. And, and Shannon, I, I feel like I'm slightly putting you on the spot, and I apologize, but M McGilla entertainment is is do they have a record of scintillating and scandalous um productions nice choice of words <laughs> i i cannot say for their entire portfolio of what that includes however this particular project is not and and if the county attorney's office has made provisions accordingly we uh, are not going to um, have any, shall we say, uh, 
scandalous um, entertainment. So, maybe we should have uh, Googled them first. So, <laughs> so the synopsis for the um, for this particular filming is included with the the memo, which just includes uh, an individual and their pet walking down the beach. That it's Becky and John. It's the couple. Okay, <laughs> two two individuals. Mr. President, I'd like to make a motion. Yes, sir. That we. Um, Authorize the board president to sign the location agreement allowing filming to take place at Flon Flag Ponds Nature Park on March 9th, 10th, and 11th, 2022. Have second. a motion and second. a second. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. Next item on our new business Department of Public uh, Parks and Rec, Director Nizal. Yes, sir. So this item is the special events policy update background in coordination with the former deputy county administrator and Department of Economic Development. The Department of Parks and Recreation coordinated with all appropriate county departments and service agencies to draft a special events policy and manual. The definition of special events mirrors the definition in Chapter 82 of Calvert County Code and the documents provided for the oversight of special events within the county. The special events policy and manual ensures the safety and security of all residents and visitors while assisting event coordinators in planning successful events with a positive economic impact to Calvert County. On January 13th, 2020, the department hired a new position of event and marketing coordinator and on August 25th, 2020, the Board of County Commissioners adopted the special events policy. Discussion. After utilizing the program for over a year, adjust adjustments are recommended based on the utilization of the program. Staff recommends that a permit only be required for special events held on county park property as defined in Chapter 82 of the Code. County or agency services that require direct cost would still be determined by and payable to that department or agency even if a permit is not required. This includes, but is not limited to, road closures, traffic control, permitting, or emergency services. The Department of Parks and Recreation will still assist with county services planning. Other adjustments include reorganization of sections and further clarifying information on waiver requests. Fiscal impact, the Department of Parks and Recreation is charged with collecting revenues and fees for programs, facilities, and services throughout the Calvert County Park System, which includes special event purposes. The impact will vary year to year. However, having a formalized policy guides the department in proper collection and allocation of those fees. Direct costs and fees for county or agency services would still be directed to that specific department or agency. Conclusion recommendation, staff recommends that the Board of County Commissioners adopt the update to the special events policy. The special events, is that a certain amount of people? The definition of a uh, special event is basically any event that is advertised to the public. Um, it doesn't matter the, the number of people per se. I thought we had something in there where it was 100 people or something. We did originally, but... So it, it really, the, currently what the, the fee schedule has in regards to the, uh, the application fee and the special event permit fee, that is based on the number of people. But the defini definition of special event is any pre-planned entertainment, sporting, cultural, business, or other type of unique activity, including parades, festivals, races, et cetera, presented to a live audience that is to be held in whole or in part upon, upon owned or managed county property or may impact the ordinary and normal use by the general public, public safety services of owned or managed county property or public right away within the vicinity of the event. Any activity that substantially inhibits the usual flow of pedestrian traffic or vehicular travel or which occupies any public, private place or business or building that preempts normal use of the space by the general public or which deviates from the established use of space or building. So for instance, if so for the definition of special event, if a um, church is holding a, an activity, um, a, a fundraiser for their congregation, that would not be um, uh, defined as a special event um, per, per code and per the policy because that's a allowable use of that building or space. Um, there are inc incidents 
instances where uh, specific uh, activities are not allowable um, per different, um, it might be agricultural use or something like that, where a particular activity is not allowable um, per their zoning, um, which a special event would be um, indicated, uh, it would be a special event per the definition because it's not a normal allowable use of that place or building. So, so if I held a family wedding <clears throat> on the farm and I invited 500 people, I would only need a special event permit if I had to close the county road or my crowd impeded on the public in, in some way. In the current special event policy, that's correct. In the update to the policy, um, even if there were to be any road closures or county services required, mm -hmm. um, a permit would not be needed. However, they would still need to um, be provided uh, the information from the sheriff's department or any uh, highways used for barricades, that sort of thing, and they would, uh, it would, there would be a need for that to be paid for, for county so services. I would need a permit, but if I created an issue where county services had to be provided, I'm responsible for reimbursement of those county. That's correct. Services. That's okay. correct. What happens to somebody if they hold an event and they don't get a permit? What happens? So at this time, uh, there is uh, the, uh, what we are able to do is not allow them a permit in the future um, and let them know what they are uh, responsible for. So if, however, if sheriff's deputies are not hired or um, uh, road closures are not done, um, there is no invoice to that but beforehand if the event is not known of uh, however uh, in the the future if that is an issue that's something that um, the entities that are responsible for those types of county services uh, can deter those agencies from having and offering services to those planners so if somebody has an event they don't get a permit so there's no pre-planning sheriff's office is called sheriff's office has the right to make them cease and desist that's correct even on, private pro even on private property so it would be the they could do whatever it is they need to do on public. private property however if they're in the roadway they could cease yes. and desist their use of a roadway so you hold a party at your house right Everybody parks out on the road. Everybody shows up and they start blocking the road. The sheriff's office has the ability to make them move all those vehicles. Per this policy. Mr. I just want to make sure he's nodding. The, the nuisance laws remain in effect. Right. So, yes, they could enforce right. the nuisance laws. So if they got a permit ahead of time, knew they were going to have some impact to the road, they could mitigate that with the sheriff's office and probably still be able to hold their event. If they don't get a permit, and there's no pre-planning, the sheriff's office can show up and make them move all those cars, and if they have no place else to park, they got to go. Hope Which, you have a big field. Well, and, and that's what the whole intention of the <coughs> permit was, to, you know, for, to make sure that if there's a large event that, you know, we know ahead of time, try to avoid, you know, on the day of the cops showing up and shutting it down and everybody not happy. So. And what we've found over the, the past year um, is a significant amount of event planners um, in the nonprofit sector um, that have had concerns with the, the process. So this is an effort to mitigate those, those concerns of the application and uh, uh, permit process for those types of activities. Earlier we talked about an event that's you know, occurs in Calvert County, if that event did not impact the county road, they'd be good. But because it always does, you know, and they 
have not controlled that in the past, that's our issue where we have to go out and provide some services. Um, and with but this if I control it on my own property, we're good. So so long as they're they're meeting all other requirements yeah, with right. any other permits they need with tent permits or uh, zoning violations or anything like that. Right. Okay. Any other discussion, questions, motions? Move to approve. Second. So there's a motion and a second that we adopt the amendment to the special events policy. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Commissioner. Director. Thank you. Item, next item on the agenda is item three, Department of Public Works, County Administration Building. Director Dahl, Deputy Director Cosgrove, if you don't trim that thing, you're going to need a bigger scarf. Good, <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Kerry Dahl, Director of Public Works. My partner, J.R. Cosgrove. Okay, uh, today we're going to provide you an update on the county administration building. <clears throat> so, getting right into it. The, the, main, the, the main goals or the main uh, core requirements that we had when we first started this, this project was to, one, increase the courthouse capacity. Second one was to eliminate leased properties from the county budget because we were spending an exorbitant amount of money doing that. And obviously the courthouse needed to increase capacity, so we needed to move the county administration and everything out of this, out of this building to go ahead and occupy a new one. As the uh, process evolved, uh, when we started getting into it, we started looking at, okay, so why are we building the building? Well, we're obviously the public offering is the primary concern, making sure the public has what they need to do their business for the county here in that one building. Eliminate themselves running around, bringing the treasurer's office into the building, bringing soil conservation, and then consolidating the county administration inside that building. We uh, believe that we should be optimizing anything that we learn from teleworking, okay? Optimizing space constraints or, you know, something we could do to optimize the space within the building. Uh, and then, of course, as we got into planning for optimizing the space, we uh, also realized that we also needed to plan for potential growth because we started looking at the longevity of the building, and the longevity of the building itself should be it's formerly like the one was before that. The last building was built in the 70s. It lasted us until 2020, 2021, and we should probably be looking at a 40 or 50-year plan for a building to actually replace it. So we wanted to make sure that we did those things correctly. If you look at this timeline, uh, our, uh, our, pro our projects, objectives, and milestones, that's what POEM stands for, you got three different colors up there. Three, uh, the, the purple is actually the phase one, the planning, the, two, the green is construction, and the blue is actually the reoccupation of the new building. That's a reset timeline based on why we're essentially here to see you today. The red line obviously says we are here to update you, but the received the 30% cost adjustment or you know, the cost estimate is why we're here today to actually have that discussion with you about that. So when we did that, the design of the building itself uh, is we got to 116,000 square feet and it came back at a $61 million price tag at about 525 square feet for the total construction. So we didn't like that because that was too much and we went back and had that done again. When it came back the second time, it came almost back exactly the same. So we had to go ahead and start uh, basically hit a, res or a pause button and then take a look at what we were planning. <clears throat> Here's the evolution of essentially where the building was rolling. In 2018, when we were planning to go to Armory Square, we were looking at $423 per square foot, a $41.8 million building, but we also had a, uh, a two-level story parking garage attached to that building. When we initiated this plan uh, we, in 2020, we were looking at an 85,000 square foot building, roughly about $360 per square foot at a $30.6 million price tag. But somewhere along the way, when we uh, start looking in and looking at those two previous missions, when we start talking about the public offering, optimizing space for telework, we realized that potentially we couldn't like have a space 
we need we potentially needed the space for everyone to come into the building okay but we still got a little bit too big all right and then also the construction costs that we're dealing with across the board right now uh, we're looking at about a 30% increase in total construction costs. We're seeing it in other uh, projects that we're working as well, but we're currently looking at a, a, an increased inflation there as far as the price tag goes because of the construction costs. But anyway, so if I had to summarize it, it's like we're, our, our ideas got bigger than our budget, and then the actual price tag of things being costed today inflated that price to $61 million. So can you list some items that took us from 85,000 square feet to 116? Well, it, I, just, I'll help you while you think. You know, originally we were told that the people that telework would have <coughs> a shared space, that they would just come in if they had to come in, and they would. Today you'd use it. If I'm in tomorrow, I use it. But I thought I heard you just say that somewhere along the line, somebody said, nope, they've still got to have an office even though they're working from home. We should have a place. The reason I think that uh, we, we got some guidance on that, when I say guidance, we actually collaborated a little bit with the, County Administrator's Office on this, and I, I believe what we were predicting is that is that we didn't necessarily believe that, you know, over the test of time, it, a new board, uh, you know, a new evolution of leadership, maybe the telework uh, model would not hold true for the next foreseeable future. Maybe it would it would change. So we started creating those spaces and shrinking them down necessarily from a full office size that we currently experienced in the former building, but we gave them a workspace, and that required anywhere from a six by eight to a nine by nine cube for them to actually operate and actually do work in. And that's where some of the spaces came. And then there were some other things that we added. Uh, we talked about having a, a, a conference and communication center to the, to the plan, okay? And uh, some of those were gonna be available for public venue, obviously, and then for use by the, you know, the residents themselves. So those things were all added, okay, for use. And, uh, and again, like I said, our, our ideas got a little bit bigger than our budget when we were looking at that. So did those items add 30,000 square feet? We went from 85 to 116. It's 30,000 square feet. Yes, sir. And the one thing that I will mention, too, is that we plan for growth. Uh, I forgot to mention that previously. So when I look at the planning for growth, if you look at over a 50-year model, you know, we think we were averaging about 3 or 4% growth over the last 10 years. From of the county staff, and then we start projecting that out. We still needed more square footage. So if I use example of like uh, public works, I probably have about, I don't know, the ability, how many is it, total number spaces? So public works, when we laid ours out, we have about 20% room for growth. So we have six additional workstations above the staff we currently have. So when you're designing these workspaces, there's a criteria based on a job to I assume yes, sir. some people might need a little more room based on what they do. Yes, yes sir. Absolutely. So we, we had different offices laid out depending on whether you were a director, a deputy director, a division chief, or basically how many staff members you supervise versus just being, let's just say, for DPW, like a review engineer. I do have a backup slide that I need probably help from the back room to pull up because I can only go forward and back here. but. I can show you the actual office sizes that I had those, and I did not add them. I'm just asking the question as far as when you're designing, you're using some kind of a standard that. Yes, sir. We, we actually had a, a work session with uh, uh, the different department heads and with the county administrator's office where we actually laid out you know, the, it right there in front of them, okay, who needs to have a larger office? Who needs to have a workstation? And we went through those those things and actually made those plans up and set those down and actually use those as a rule of thumb. And it, uh, I would just say that Public Works tried to model our workstation and our offices after those requirements. And we chose the, used those as examples to the different departments to actually build theirs. There, there are certain industry standards from OSHA and MOSHA for space needed mm -hmm. for workstations. Mm -hmm. um, but like Director Saul, we also base it on, on usage. You know, if you're, if you're a review engineer and you're reviewing plans you need additional space in your area to set right. out plans versus you know maybe being admin assistants where you're not looking at 24 to right. 36 you know inch plans so we, we took all that into account and basically you know as far as supervisor role it's you know if you're a director generally you kind of want room to have a small meeting in your office so you don't have to find another area um, if you're supervising employees you're going to want somewhere where you can call in your employees and go over you know performance evaluations and, and somewhat of a 
you know, confined, you know, personal space. But they're, yeah. a sh they're not a shared space? There, there is some shared spaces. We do have collaboration spaces throughout the area, but they're not necessarily, you know, within four walls. It's more of an open environment, you know, to meet some of the requirements for natural lighting and so forth throughout the building. And I'm just trying to understand the growth. It's the only yes, sir. To my question. Understood. Mm -hmm. So if, from 21 to where we are now in 2022, uh, we went basically hit the reset button, and we've uh, essentially – Optimize the space based on what we learned from telework. That's still factored in. We've uh, done some scalable options and pulled some of those back to, and also plan for growth. And we're currently at a design right now that's at 94,000 square feet thereabouts with about 525 per square foot is what we're using from the cost estimate that we received in 2021. So right now we're looking at an increase uh, from our current budget of $37.5 million to 30, oh, excuse me, $37 million, about $49.5 million, excuse me. So there's a list of the scalable options that we've uh, selected for use. There are some on, some on there where we said we could dial it back and go to, like, a hoteling station, which means we would have a station that would uh, be used by several individuals as opposed to just one individual. Uh, we did not include that one. Uh, another one that we took out that we did not use is the way that we would put the networking in through the floor of the building. Otherwise, we're keeping that one in because that would be able to reconfigure a floor space much easier than using walls to actually use that networking configuration. So there's some things that we did that we kept in that we probably could have saved some money on, not necessarily square footage, but we actually put those, took, left those in there because it made more sense to do that in the long run. But just for the record... By removing Parks and Rec, the plan is that they're going to be someplace else. Correct. Yes, so sir. So while that's a cost saving in this building, it's a cost on another project to provide them space. Correct. Just so the public understands that it's. And and those those were part of and, and again this the ones that we pulled out of here were considering, the other options that were on the table, right. like uh, community uh, you know re resources is currently in a building that we don't lease. It's one that the county owns. Right. So and they're, they're the staying thing, put. For the public, we do own buildings that we currently occupy that those individuals are going to move into that building, which frees up that space. Correct. Correct. And back to office space. So in your department, you have inspectors that spend 80% of their day Correct. on the road. Correct. What kind of space do they have or are they required to have? We show a, basically a five-by-six work area, which is no more than a five-foot-wide desk that they can sit in front of. That's it. Um, and that's to jack into the network, do administrative business they would have to do for maybe an hour or two hours a week that they would be in the office right. and then get back out and go I, do what I they're going to do. Yep. Yes, sir. For those types of jobs that are not in an office, what you do for those. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it, just to, to rehash, if we uh, go back and do these things, uh, essentially – when we reduce the square footage of the building, it allows the building to be moved back to the north and it basically reduce the amount of site work, okay? Uh, the existing budget is 37.5. The, the prediction for this one is 49.5 at this square footage. So uh, we're essentially uh, working with finance and bu budget right now and have, have worked with them, and we have identified uh, bonding authority that could be, used, that be exercised uh, through projects that are complete or projects that have basically not been continued and or we are able to move that bonding authority to the building for about $12 million. We've actually identified more than $12 million, closer to 13, 13. 13 million that we have available. So projects that in the past we requested bonding authority for through legislation, but those projects never moved forward. And that authority was never exercised. Correct. Correct. Some, some of them are complete. Like, for instance, one of our transportation projects we're reallocating funding, I think there's an extra, like, $1.2 of authority for Fairgrounds Road improvements. Well, we've completed that project, but the authority is still there. So you have allocated funding, that surplus funding, that you can move towards. Correct. The Just realign yes, so it helps out this project. Correct. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. And, again, uh, we believe that this 94,000 square foot facility that we have planned is roughly a 50-year investment and, and will 
keep us in business for, for some time to come. And how much room in that 94,000 is there for expansion to, to put additional desks in and additional workspaces? Well, uh, so, I'll let you answer that. So one. maybe we kind of give guidance, guidance to the departments to, to pretty much take into account anywhere between 10 to 20 percent growth over the next, you know, 50 years. So there's workstations built in for that. And if you look at some of the floor plans we've, we've come up with, not only is there additional workstations planned in the area, there's also collaboration spaces, more of kind of a, let's just say, a, a lounge area for you to sit down and talk to a client or, or, or a citizen that eventually could be turned into an additional workstation or even an office if need be. So not only is there additional workstations planned, there's areas within each department that could turn into a workstation in the future. For some reason, our growth is greater than we anticipated. There is, a, there is a modularity to the actual design of the floor plan. Otherwise, so we go with the floor for the networking. You don't have to move walls now, okay? We don't have to build, you know, you know, reconfigure an office. It's actually we could bring in a cubicle or actually we could probably build a wall within the facility if we had to go that route. But right now we're in a position where we can actually reconfigure the floor itself. So with the consideration of the adjacent buildings inside the, quote, courtyard, uh, the, the other community area or county area and around the parking lot. With the 94,000 square foot building, you're extremely confident that we wouldn't have to do any major renovations, meaning add-ons or extending or anything else well, over the next again, that, 15, that goes, 20 years? Yes, sir. Well, that goes back to uh, what we were looking at when we went from 85,000 and we jumped up because, you know, we were trying to figure out how to essentially plan for growth Okay, and again, we got a little bit over the top on that, but uh, I will tell you that uh, the, the, the plan was, is I don't want to put the Board of County Commissioners, either this one or the one or the one after that, in a position to where they have to go lease another building. I don't, I don't want to go that route. I would like to get us in a position to where that building is the footprint of the county government and it's able to do its business within the confines of that, that space. Because if we go out and 10 years from now, have to build, you know, go lease another building, then I don't think we've done a good job with this right. plan. Exactly. And would there be, would you see or would you look against any type of extension on what's currently proposed, either in length or width or anything like that, to help facilitate any possible future growth, or you're good with where we are? I feel we're pretty good where we are. The problem with, if you extend a building and, I think Carrie has a slide in here that kind of shows what we're proposing with the 94,000 square foot building. It starts hindering the circulation around the building because we only have so much depth that we can work with. Gotcha. And if we start making it wider, we start losing efficiency of how you lay out the office space. Right. And we start impacting parking, which would generate increased cost on site work because now we've got to rebuild the parking somewhere else. Because we can't lose it, we need to retain it. So. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. To piggyback off kind of what you were saying, you don't want to build a building and then need to rent space Absolutely. prior. But my thought is, is was the same as yours when we were originally going to build the building, including the communication center, the parks and recs, the community resources, and all those other things. And now, you know, we're building a building that I thought was going to be $35 million for 15 million more. So my whole reasoning originally to agree to to vote on this was we weren't moving it over to the other site, um, which most of the citizens wanted it to stay in the town, so I was good with that. And when I voted to tear the, the building down, we were at 35 million. And so my 20% my would be to wait until uh, the building material, This none of this is y'all's fault. I appreciate all the work y'all have done. But I want to build a building that I originally voted on for the cost that I voted on it to, to include the communication center and the parks and recs and be able to have everybody in there. Because now we got to go back out and rent more space to move everybody around or or pay or continue to pay to move everybody around. So I just I consciously can't vote on, you know, almost fifty million dollars um, taxpayer money right now with with everything going on. I, I just think that the building materials have just got to come back down to reality at some point. Um, it's just bad timing. It really is. It's nothing you guys did, you know. Well, two, two things happened. You know, the building that, at least when I first took office, grew by 30%. Mm -hmm. 
and construction costs have almost doubled. So right. we got caught twice. Right. Yes, sir. The, the problem is we've torn down that existing building. We have staff working out of closets. And as you saw from that earlier slide, even on the plan we are now, it's going to be 25. So we can't wait. Uh, we, we just got to make some kind of a decision. But waiting, I don't see as an option to defer this another year and have staff working out of closets for another, you know, whatever. I mean, to... To, to add to that, as far as the cost ex escalation, if you look at the price we were looking at in 2020 <clears throat> and add 30% to that, it pretty much gets you close to $50 million. So granted, our building is slightly larger than we're proposing now, 94000 versus eighty five. Just in construction cost escalation alone gets you to the dollar amount we're at. And even the slide that we showed at Evolution, the price keeps increasing per square foot. We'll never be back down to where we were in the thoughts of 2020. I don't see the, it, it coming down that much. Will and it if come down some, maybe it might <clears throat> even come down some by the time we bid this out in twenty four. You know, and we've still got the buildings that we own. Correct. That we, we're currently occupying. That some of those people, the annex, all those people in the annex are going to go in the new building. Correct. If community resources stays in the Duke building, then they're still there. Correct. But we, we've still got the annex as room for growth. I don't even know what the plan is to do with that in the interim. If everybody's moving out of it, we can't just let it sit empty because we know what happens to empty buildings. Part of, we Mr. will have the mailroom in there. Yes, sir. Mr. President, we, we also acquired the Waters property. Yes, so that building future. will be available mm -hmm. soon, I think. Yes. Well, most important of that, is that where G.H. Clark was? They're moving the out. The parking so is what is needed there. Yeah. Right. Commissioners, uh, Mark Willis County Administrator, I'll point out uh, only, sir, I do understand, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, we thought the price of that building was going to be X. Every year that goes by, we're paying more and more rent currently in, in, in the buildings that we're in. We do own some buildings. But the reality is, if you look back, uh, and I know I've got an expert at least in the office because we have uh, this... Uh, Plumber Welker in the audience, she probably knows this, but even uh, Mary Beth uh, from uh, Planning and Zoning. The building we tore down was one of two buildings that were supposed to be built, and they waited 20 to 30 years to, to build that. They never did. And then the cost to finally get there now potentially is a $50 million building. The price is not going to go down. We're going to continue to pay that monthly rent that we pay for the, the buildings that we're currently renting. So I don't know that it's ever going to get cheaper. We can be more efficient. We can be frugal. Uh, I just checked with the uh, Director of Human Resources, Melody Woodson. We have currently 333 individuals teleworking. Uh, I plan on, uh, as the administrator, to continue to, to work on making that even more efficient uh, as, as we move forward. But the idea is that we always have to prepare for more increased space. Uh, you know, we talk on the one side about not uh, of being very careful about how much we increase the population and therefore the need to support that population within Calvert County. If we're controlling that growth, then we're controlling the amount of uh, uh, employees that we're going to add to the system. So the more efficient we are on the one end, the more efficient we're going to be on the other end. So. This is about as close as I think we're going to get, taking into account a uh, square foot reality for how big a, an office space should be, how many folks we should squeeze in there, parking spaces, et cetera. So I, I don't know that it gets easier. I've just always figured that those buildings that we own are expansion. You know, if we're designing and building to meet our needs today, that space that we currently own, we're not going to sell. That's our expansion, and, and we can we can use it for other uses in interim. But and, when and the sir, day came, and your your point is very well taken, and that was you know what are we going to do with the annex, uh, for example, when we move uh, technology services and, and general services uh, into the new building, uh, you know, uh, across the country. One of the reasons that we're putting that administrative building where it is is to support the look of Main Street, Calvert County. It's in the comprehensive plan. It's in the town center master plan. The whole reason for that was to bring it back from Armory Square, to put it in Prince Frederick proper so that it could support small business, small entrepreneurial 
businesses along Main Street, Calvert County. My goal, as mentioned too, and she's probably hard working at her desk, our, our new Director of Economic Development, Julie Oberg, is to research what we have to do to get federal dollars, state dollars, to improve the look of Prince Frederick Main Street as we go forward. And that's what some of those buildings are gonna serve as. It, it, it might take 10 years, it might take 15 years, but that's part of the renovation of Main Street when we move into that building. Very good. The, the only thing I have left to show you, sir, is basically the, the former design. That's the footprint of the former design. Here is the, the new design that's just the footprint, not necessarily, you know, profile view or anything like that, just overhead. That's what the former design looked like as it was shifted to the south. That's the area in blue. Uh, the additional parking to its left that we would have to accommodate so we could compensate for the amount of parking that we were taking away by, based on the increased footprint size. And then it's now sliding back to the north. It's all in light blue there. And again, the footprint. So basically on the existing site that's currently out there and be able to maintain the parking. And that would re, that the, the, the decreased amount of site work is a lot of the cost that we would essentially be saving in the, in the new of the 94,000 square foot facility. So based on the current footprint, back to Commissioner Gadway's question about future expansion, <coughs> you don't believe there's an opportunity on the south side of the building, the southeast corner of the building, if the need arose? I know you talk about flow around the building, but I'm just asking. I mean, you could widen into the south, yes. We'd lose, I think Some it's parking. Like 30 parking spaces along there. Just thinking out. I mean, there is an opportunity. It would create its own Correct. issues. We, I mean, we, we'd have to go back towards the north and start building additional parking in the wooded area like we proposed on the other one. But, you know, the more you do that, it increases your site cost. And, and we have other ideas that we're planning on 10, 12 years out that would actually, that are not on the CIP, that would accommodate additional parking. So that's, those are just things that we're looking at from our office on how we could get that, make that better for everybody. Personally, I don't believe teleworking is going away. I think it's going to get more teleworking. I, I think it's a marketable uh, employee enhancement that is good, and I think it's uh, something that will stick around for quite some time. As long as they do their job. Absolutely. You know, it's a great benefit, and employees are going to demand that, you know. So, any other questions? So today... And then my final recommendation, sir, uh, for this is obviously to approve the 94,000 square foot facility at a revised budget of $49.5 million. That's our recommendation. I wish it was longer. Excuse me? I wish it was bigger. I, I'll make a motion that we accept staff's uh, recommendation. Is there a second? A second. I have a motion and a second that we adopt staff's recommendation. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Two to one? No, I just, okay. aye, aye. Okay, sorry, I didn't hear you. Three sorry. to one, motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, sir. You, sir. Next item on the agenda is a presentation. Department of Finance and Budget. Good morning, Veronica. Good morning. Good morning, Hi, Commissioners. Veronica Atkinson, Capital Projects Analyst, Finance and Budget. Thank you. Carrie stole your equipment. Yeah, he's like stealing the equipment. <laughs> well, one of his divisions is on here, so that might be why. Ah. I'll read the memo. Background. The Department of Finance and Budget and Communications and Media Relations, CMR, Technology Services, TS, 
town centers, planning and zoning, and the Department of Public Works Enterprise Fund, which is solid waste, water, and sewer, will present their proposed fiscal year 2023 six-year capital improvement plan, or CIP, to the Board of Commissioners. Discussions. The Department of Finance and Budget reviewed the CIP request for the FY23 through FY28 six-year staff recommended budget for CMR, TS, town centers, planning and zoning, general fund requests, totally $13,440,000. Additionally, Finance and Budget reviewed the request for the Enterprise Fund, totaling $87,039,327. For the FY23 through FY28 six year CIP. The Enterprise Fund is financially supported by the users of the services. Fiscal Impact The fiscal impact to the county's general fund for CMR, TS, town centers, planning, and zoning is $13,440,000. The Enterprise Fund fiscal impact for the six-year budget is $87,039,327. Conclusion recommendation. This presentation will prepare the board for the six-year capital improvement plan cost and seek the board's direction on those projects. In today's presentation, we are looking to the board for direction regarding the projects listed in each department. We will review the FY23 six-year CIP breakdown of costs by division and each project with the project lead, and we will review the total FY23 CIP expenses and revenue. FY23 is very important because this is the only year that is adopted or funded by the Board of County Commissioners. Please remember that today's review is of two funds. The general fund, which is supported by the citizen's tax, which is the chart below, reflects a high-level review. CMR Public Broadcast Division, 2023, $170,000,000, $1,020,000 for the sixth year. Technology Services, $2,000,000 for FY23, and their six-year total is $12,250,000. Town centers is 40,000 in FY23, six year, 40,000. Planning and zoning, 65,000 for FY23 and 130,000 in their six year. I didn't even switch over to you guys, sorry. So this is the one I just read. This slide is, this is the Enterprise Fund, which is the second fund. This fund, again, is solely supported by the fees collected from the users of the services. Here is a high-level review of their project. Solid waste recycling has nothing projected for FY23, and their sixth year is $1,650,000. Water, $1,825,000 for FY23, $4,175,000 for their sixth year, Sewerage is $673,000 for FY23, and their six year is $81,214,327. Any questions? Man. It's very quiet up there today. Oh. I don't know why that I, is. I don't <laughs> either. I don't either. Don't, don't start. <laughs> Okay. Could it be? Yeah, could potentially be. I think my presentation today Sorry, doesn't it, have anything that interests maybe. The maybe. eighty one the eighty one million left me speechless. That's why Commissioner Hart's not here either. Uh, Correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start with our general fund projects. Our first project is with communications and media relations, CMR. And their project is referred to as PEG. I'm trying to think of the PEG channel is owned now and operated by Calvert County government. Linda, do you want to take this one? Sure. Thank um, you. Just a quick synopsis. The the PEG or the public education and government channel 
operated by us, taken over from Comcast during the recent franchise agreement update. This fee comes in from the users of Comcast and is required to come back into county government for use for capital expenditures. So it's, we have to put it into the CIP. And that's essentially it. It doesn't come out of general fund real property tax revenue. Also with capital projects, the money is able to roll. We're in operating. If they don't use the money at the end of the year, it goes away. But capital, it'll roll through the use. Any questions? Our next department is Technology Services. Amy Lawson, Director of Technology Services. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Jeez, it is the afternoon. So um, in looking at technology services, the first item is enterprise systems implementation. This is our software. So as you know, one of my personal goals is to modernize the software and the technology that we have here in Calvert County. This number here that you see, the $300,000, is for those implementations and those upgrades to the software that we have. Um, a couple of the systems that we're looking at would be our utility billing, Parks and Rec, and more specifically, um, our uh, highway engineering. So those are the three systems that we'll be looking at for FY23. The geographic information systems, we have a six-year plan in order to get the mapping that's required for our GIS analysts. The number that you see here, is it, it's that time. It's that time for us to go through and uh, update our mapping, and so the $300,000 is for that initiative. The network infrastructure, $500,000 of this network infrastructure is uh, a placeholder for the preparations for the new building. So we don't want to hit you up with the entire amount all at one time. We wanted to spread it out over the different fiscal years. So we're building up our kitty, if you will, for when we actually implement in 25. This is $500,000 to be put towards that. In addition to um, $150,000 for existing network infrastructure. I will note, we did remove $400,000 from network infrastructure. Um, we do believe that this will be needed, but with the infrastructure bill that passed at the federal level, there is a significant amount of money for local governments at, for building out infrastructure and broadband, and we'll, we're hoping to be able to um, feed off of that in order to meet the needs that we'll have for FY23 and 24. Our phone systems upgrade, the $250,000 is for uh, a new server, and our public safety system we're looking at about $500,000. This includes uh, upgrading the detention center software. Uh, excuse me, it is the corrections module that will um, replace the, the, the implementation of the detention center and upgrade it to the same platform as the computer-aided dispatch system, the enterprise CAD. And that is technology services. Are there any questions? So, Veronica, the $650,000, that will be part of the total project cost for the building right no we don't have that included since it's separated over here so the money in the capital for the um, county administration building mm -hmm. that's the majority of that money is construction equipment um, furniture things of that nature we had a discussion with um, Department of Public Works to decide how we were going to split the costing out and it, the decision was made that technology services would put in our CIP the funds that would be necessary in order to stand up the network the infrastructure for the new building. So what you see here is the technology side of the new building. It's not included in DPW. I understand that. I'm just trying in my head to fit, that's already part of the well, what we just heard, 49.5, or this is above and beyond? Above and beyond. So at some point, we need to know what the above and beyond is for everything, because it's not a $49.5 million building. That was the reason for my question. So at some point, uh, yeah. Uh, understood, Commissioner. And uh, with, uh, with the exception of technology services, I, I do believe, and I can be corrected, uh, we have looked at everything else that needs to go into that building. For example, we made a tough decision 
uh, when we started to design the building that we have we had a lot of furniture it was a a mixed matched combination of everything that you can think of and for us to try to fit that into the building just didn't make any sense for us to and we staff actually went on trips to look at this to include the deputy county administrator to make sure that modern furniture was going to go in this modern building sized to the actual ocean motion sizing of the office space and so that's in there however uh the technology services i i, I worked not i didn't work i merely offered up a suggestion and that is that she take over responsibility to put all new uh, infrastructure in that building because we have a band-aided system that is the only thing that to my knowledge is separate right now so and I don't want to get into a lengthy discussion about that right now but at some point we need a move-in number yes absolutely sorry Amy. <laughs> thank you that was the only question I have any other questions thank you thank, thank you. you get your mask thank you Our next item is town centers. Jenny, long range planner with planning and zoning. She's coming. It's hard when they're behind me because I'm yeah, not I sure mean. if they're coming or. She thought it was church. She sat in the back pew. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. For the town center projects, we currently have two underway. Prince Frederick is in the second of three phases, and Dunkirk is in its initial phase. We have five more to do. Our request for you for this fiscal year coming up is for $40,000. Is that to do one town or more than one? That is to do more than one. The, the, there's the total on the far side of the chart, so that would, um, we believe, include that coming up we've got Lesby and Solomon's. And then we've got three more to do, Owings, Huntingtown, and St. Leonard. It'll depend. Each time we get into a town center, we receive public feedback on what the important issues are. And so um, at this point, that's our estimate for the town centers. I just was wondering what you get for 40 grand. <laughs> we'll be adding money that we already, that you've oh, already approved. It's more than 40 for it two. It is but. more than 40 grand. So for example, the um, Prince Frederick, we were assisted by a consultant on the, the land use transportation um, goals and a um, vision. And that was about 96, just under 96,000. And then for the bikeways, the town center bikeways plan for Prince Frederick and Dunkirk, there was a state grant that the commissioners added to, so we had 88000 in a state grant. And I believe we added 22 of the county's money for that project. Isn't it true if you um, <clears throat> incorporate the park into the town center, you're, it opens you up for more funding from the state? Is that true? The, uh, yes, because then we, we would no, need to go through a process, one, the park the Dunkirk District Park and the um, Park and Ride would need to officially be included into the Dunkirk Town Center. That is the commissioner's purview with the zoning map amendment. That would allow us to go to the state and request expansion of the Dunkirk priority funding area. Right. And by being a priority funding area, that opens up um, additional state funds. Right. For example, if one were to put sidewalks along a um, property in a priority funding area, the state will fund 100% of that sidewalk retrofit program. Outside the town center, it's only 50%, and then the local jurisdiction would be responsible for the other 50%. And that includes schools too, right? Yes. Um, well, schools are, um, there's an exemption process for schools outside the priority funding area. However, with a school being inside a priority funding area, it's just a, a check mark on a box. Got you. But we've never been denied. For we have schools. never been denied for schools, correct. We've had to explain why it was outside a town center, the PFA, yes. So what other, we always hear about sidewalks. What other funding does it open you up for? It opens up funding for private businesses. There is, um, and I, sorry, I don't have all the list in front of me. But there is um, tax credits available to businesses within priority funding areas. There's, a, I believe, a lower threshold on the number of employees that they need to 
um, have in order to uh, qualify for uh, state funds. I would be glad to provide the list to you at a, um, after the meeting. It, but it also allows them to get business loans at a lower interest rate too, right? Yes. Yes, which is huge, yeah. Sorry, mm -hmm. you can continue. That's all I have. Oh, that's all you have? Yes. Oh, sorry. Next up will be my coworker, Paul Conover, for the next item under we, planning. We were just testing you and you passed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, she had the answers. <laughs> That's you important. I told you you picked the wrong one to try to test. I yeah. know. Commissioners, while we're waiting for Paul to come up, the interesting <laughs> thing about this is that uh, in what planning and zoning is doing now is they're actually front-loading funding so that they don't so that they can keep town centers moving forward as far as being updated. In the past, it would be one town center. So we actually have, they're working on two different town centers at the same time, which is really the first time they've ever done that. And they can't do it without preloaded funding. So this really helps them keep moving forward. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. Paul Conover, Planning Commission Administrator. Um, so what you have before you is a request for a flood mitigation plan over the course of three years to hire a consultant. Now, if you're not, for those not familiar with the flood mitigation plan, it's even using the word comprehensive is an understatement. And with the size of Calvert County, a consultant can come in, can look at what has been um, susceptible to flood damage in the past, what is currently susceptible, and also predict what the future susceptibility and inundation to the county can be. And then also um, suggest some remedies um, and ordinance changes that we can adopt. Also, for the county to have the flood mitigation plan. It's also a requirement for the NFIP or the National Flood Insurance Program, which we participate in, which offers uh, discounts and flood insurance to the public. Uh, it's, a, it's definitely a, a plan that is necessary. It's still currently under review and we'd like to get it finished. So this is to finish uh, an update that's already started? It's, it's currently updated. It's never been approved. Mm. And it's a three-year process? Uh, Yes. That's how it's funded. That's what, so. yes. Yeah. It's looking like. Okay. That's all I have. Nothing here. Nothing. Okay. They test for you today. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Good you, luck. Paul. It's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Our next slide will review enterprise funds projects. Again, these projects are self-supported by the users of these um, utilities. I'm not really sure today who's going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, they're coming. <laughs> Emily. Morning. Afternoon. Morning. Yeah, afternoon. I just keep hoping. I just hope we don't have to say good evening to anybody. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always hopeful for that. Yeah. Hi, so my name is... Pub, oh. We're not going to limit public comment. Nope. <laughs> I won't talk that long, okay? <laughs> <laughs> my name is Emily Matthews. I'm a project engineer. I work for um, Enterprise Funds. I, I normally do water engineering, but also I do solid waste projects also. Um, so our first... Our, we have two projects here for solid waste. The first is the waste diversion reuse facility. This project is to renovate the existing salt barn at the Appeal Solid Waste Facility, and it will accept building materials to be repurposed and reused by other community members. So that project is $400,000 that we have estimated for it. The other project is the recycling material storage building, and this is gonna be a fabric tarp building for recycling materials and processing. And it will will have materials that are placed inside the facility and then reloaded into containers and trailers that are shipped off for recycling. And that one we have it estimated at 1.25 million, both in the fiscal year of 24. And those are our only two solid waste projects right now that we have on the the CIP. Where would that building go? It will be located at our appeal facility. Yep. I think we're good. Okay. So then I'll move right into the water projects. So our first project up here on the list is the Cavalier Country 
uh, Cavalier Country Water Distribution System Replacement. So this will be um, our second distribution replacement project that we have. Right now we're working on our design for the Chesapeake Heights Water Distribution Replacement Project. And really it is just putting a whole new system and a whole new distribution system in and the, the connections to the houses. And also um, installing some more valves throughout the system so that we can, we can isolate parts of the system when needed. So we have our design happening fiscal, of tw fiscal year 24 and then the construction um, money for 25. So the next project is, is, a similar, is a similar type of project is the Shores of Calvert distribution system replacement. Pretty much the same, the same type of project, but we've, we've made it go out a little farther for the design happening in 26 and the construction in 27. Then our next couple, well, next three projects here are kind of something that you're probably familiar with. It's our um, replacement type of project. So the small water main replacements, it's $50,000 every year. It just lets us do little work that um, through maintenance that we found that there's some parts of our system that need fixing um, that we don't have to wait till we can do a big project for it. Um, the water meter replacement is part of our water meter replacement program where we're replacing aging meters as we come across them and that that is a hundred thousand each year and then the water station improvements again it's it's another um, kind of money that we have every year to do um, to do different projects that are needed in our water stations instead of having big like if unless a unless say um, station needs a big project, but if it's just little um, like co coating the tanks and doing different system upgrades that we need to do. And then the last um, CIP project we have is the West Prince Frederick storage tank. This is, we have the design money right now that we're working on the design, and then we have the construction money in 23 at one, yeah, $1.4 million. So how big a tank is that? 100,000 gallons. Is it a tower? It's a tower, Where yeah. Is now, don't ask me how tall it is, because I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't look that up before the presentation. It <laughs> it's going to go way. at the end of Stafford Road at the old Salt Bowl location is where it's planned right now. And when you replace water meters, I think I've heard in the past, what's the negative or positive impact of those meter replacements? The negative or positive impact? So you go in and replace 100 meters. Does billing show that the meters were off positively or negatively overall? I may have to direct that exact ah, question to Sharon's Chris. Sharon's coming. <laughs> Somebody's oh, oh, a coming. billing person. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hi, this is Sharon Strand, Director of Finance Budget. Um, so when the meter stops working, we cannot go back and recover that information on how to bill a water and sewer customer. So we have, the uh, water and sewer does have a list of current broken meters, and when they go replace them, the, we are able now to read the meter and bill the customer correctly for the usage. And I thought that's what I heard in the past. Generally, revenues go up when you go in and replace those meters because most of them aren't working or they're faulty. Yes. So. Yeah. As a general consensus, I wanted a, 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 an expert that knows exactly. You're the expert. I'm, You're I'm, sitting in front of the microphone. I'm an expert on the project. You think I'm an expert? <laughs> Jeez. There were a lot of them that weren't working in North Beach at one time. I don't know if they fixed them all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think they went through and did a, a big, a big, um, replacement. big replacement project. Yeah. Um, but still, you know, as they go, then this gives us the money each year to be able to work on a select number every year. Right, so it's not right. that we have to go out and do it all in a y one year we can kind of go through as they age because they do have a, a time span right but this is just one of those things i was trying to point out it's a cost but at the end it's an increase of money. revenues yes. that probably pays for itself yes uh, agreed yeah. yes very quickly they're yeah. not that expensive but yeah i think it was two years ago you guys went in and did a really big um we had a big yes yep. yeah i remember julie talking about it yeah yeah get caught up so now I think it's mainly just replacement as, as they, they go. go bad yep but yes it's a huge impact to their revenue yeah. they need that money but people probably again, aren't very happy 
No, that's right. what, when you said so negative, I was thinking that as well. <laughs> There's like, the negative side. Right. The homeowner may not be so happy. What do you mean I can't get free water anymore? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's just the water that they're using, and we want it to show the right amount. It, and it, um, you know, we can go back to how much the water we produce versus how much we're billing for and, and be able to look at that percentage, too. Gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Emily, it was very pleasant. You could stay longer. And no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because you're about to get to the $80 million number. <laughs> <laughs> She's smart. Yes. <laughs> yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is a special slide. This is for, oh, <laughs> this is a continuation of enterprise funds, and this is for sewerage and wastewater. Remember, Commissioner Gateway, these are pay for themselves. Correct. They so have to be projected out. Yeah, that's right. Yes, they have to make sure that they can afford these projects, so everything needs to be looked at very closely. Like that thing we talked about earlier at the golf course. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Hall, Division Chief for Water and Sewer. This is um, Andy Hipsky, Project Engineer 2. Welcome, gentlemen. Yeah, good afternoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do we have particular <coughs> questions about the budget? So kind of walk through your projects and ex talk about them. Okay, hang on. Biosolids processing disposal, I think that's the, the one that's increasing the money this year. Um, this is two stages. We have to increase, um, we have to replace some dewatering equipment, but we're also running into a problem of, of where we um, get rid of our sludge once we dewater it. And so we have to um, make some infrastructure to, to process the, the sludge that we can't dump anymore uh, at landfills. Right. So I know you, you all did a survey about how to dispose of that yes i have a place you can dispose of that <laughs> so this money in here is that to fund that project yes, to make that change if i'm correct me if i'm wrong it's part part of it was the design of the trying to trying to come up with a biosolid solution uh, was was our first step in that and here we've been talking to uh sierra club recently and so that's kind of don't talk to them talk to us <laughs> that's <laughs> no. kind of uh Helping us make a decision, probably. So is the total project $18 million spread out over three years, or are they different projects? Is, uh, is it 19? 24, 25, and 26. Yeah, 24, 26 all oh, show. Okay. Yeah, I don't even know that we have numbers for the, for the process biosolids um, processing. So these are projections. Mm -hmm. These are placeholders for based on um, Andy's expertise at these types of projects. Okay information we've gotten so far intermittently what we've studied so far you dry it out there's a place for it <laughs> that's why the dewatering is very important yeah. decreases right. the, the weight of the what needs to be disposed yeah, of as little water as possible your next project is prince frederick solomon's P.S. in Force, Maine. Okay, this is the project. Um, we were originally going to do the upgrade Prince Frederick number one wastewater station. We've been doing um, soil studies and so forth and found out that it's not really feasible for us to land discharge uh, in Prince Frederick. So we're proposing uh, expanding the Solomon's wastewater treatment station and pumping Prince Frederick effluent down there. So it's kind of a replacement project. So a few weeks ago, James was in here before us and presented about that project. Okay. So I can see was it the whole board or just? <laughs> and commissioners, I do want to point out that that, wasn't, that was not an internal decision simply by uh, Water and Sewer Division. That was assistance from the Maryland Department of the Environment to get to that right. point. So. Right. And this is just a placeholder, too, I'm assuming? Yes. But, yeah, this is one of those situations where we were kind of running out of options and what we were going to do with it with the effluent. We didn't have anywhere to discharge it in Prince Frederick, so and then the, the idea to kind of hopefully maybe shut down both Prince Frederick plants and send, treat everything in Solomon's. And that was an MDE proposal for the public. Yeah. So, thank you. And we're looking for grant money? Yeah. We just um, 
submitted an application for it. Because the 18 million, that's just air share. The placeholder you have, is that just for air share? Because I thought it was a larger project than that. Well, there's oh, two pieces. There is two pieces. Yes, the other piece of it is if you drop down a few projects, Solomon's Wastewater Treatment Plant ENR upgrade. Right. So what Andy has done is taken the Prince Frederick Solomon's Force Main and the Solomon's Wastewater Treatment Plant ENR upgrade and combined, even though they show here as two separate projects, he's combined them and uh, submitted an application for a complete coverage of these projects since um, its MDE was very is very supportive isn't that who that is it's very supportive of this project therefore they're encouraging us to go forward with it and we're hopeful that we will get some money for it and therefore not need as much or any of our own money so Correct? if I memory serves me right MDE offered to pay for one portion of the project or the other if we install the line, they would pay to upgrade the plant uh, or vice versa. Sort of depended on who we talked to at MDE. Uh oh, we, we need that in writing. Yeah, we kind of got a couple of different answers depending on who we talked to about that. So they've submitted everything. And we'll see. And these are just placeholders, so. Yes, it's just so we all know what's there, the projected cost for it. But for Commissioner Gadway, that's the biggest chunk of the $87 million. Yeah. With Prince Frederick one funding we applied for, we got funding for about half of it. Grant right. money for half of it. Mm -hmm. so hopefully we do the same thing overall with this. Approximately like 60 million of that number. Yeah. So we will be very happy if those grants are I think approved. you got Commissioner Weems' attention then. I think I heard a little <laughs> grunt. <laughs> <laughs> And will, when will you know? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. The grant money that they're talking about is is funding that the citizens of this county pay into that anyway. So it, it's not if we're going to get some. We're going to get some, whether it's all of it for one project or 50% for another. Nobody knows that. But the reality is the Bay Restoration Fund, every, every, <laughs> every water and sewer uh, customer pays either quarterly or annually on their bill. So we're actually getting our own money back. Uh, over a longer period of time. So there is grant money. We just don't know what that amount will Sometimes be. they don't give it back. And sometimes they don't give it back. Well, they, they seem to like the idea of this project and thought that if we did it all together that it would be close to the top of the list. So You're right. They offered it up, so yeah. they should be supportive. Right. And uh, when will don't. you hear back, Andy? Is it June? I think usually about June or July, they tell you what your ranking is. So we should hear June or July okay. of this year. But that's an out-year project anyway, so that's not going to impact 23. Solomon's Pump Station Improvements has money in FY23 of 100000 Yes, that's kind of like what Emily was talking about earlier with the water station improvement projects. We do uh, we do the same thing with our, with our wastewater pump stations, just things that come up throughout the year that need to be taken care of and you know you don't have time to wait until the next year to try to try to get the money for it um, it falls in line with the next one also I think which is Prince Frederick pump station improvements it's the exact same thing I think at one point these are supposed to be the same project but well they're two different areas yeah Everybody can see how much is being spent. The two areas where most of our pump stations are. Uh, North Beach Sewer Extension has money in FY 2023 of 340000 I think we know what that is. Okay, we can move down to grinder pump replacement, 33000 Sorry, I'm moving quicker than you are. <laughs> That's just an annual. It's yes. the same thing, yeah. It's, yeah. it's grinder pumps. We never know. It's like water paid. meters. Yeah. And they're paid for. Mm -hmm. We do collect money for the replacement of those. Well, Water Enterprise Fund collects money for the replacement. So that finishes the Enterprise Fund's projects. And that's how we get to a six-year $87,039,327.
Do we have any other questions for? I think we're good. Thank, Thank you, you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry to hold up your lunch. <laughs>
and I know that they were very concerned. They asked me um, in the audience um, about the, the bus money. So, and then I also um, was on that the Zoom call with the three boards uh, collectively, and I was glad to hear that somebody had brought up the. Um, it seems like a spike in uh, um, some issues on the bridge that uh, there's going to be a letter sent to the state hoping that some type of uh, netting or something can be put on the bridge to to help uh, with that situation. So that's all I have. All right. Mr. Ween? I, I just have a, a, a fun story. Another poem? No, not this week. Okay. Commissioner Hart and I both attended our 12-year-old's basketball game on Saturday, a Parks and Rec soiree. And um, I'm here to report that uh, my son's team was victorious. <laughs> That's good. That, that might be why he's not That's here today. That's why he's not here today. Yeah. And, uh, I should have known. It was a Pyrrhic victory. My son fouled out of the said game. But you know, that's, that's all I have to report. You know, that starts at home, Steve. <laughs> that starts at home. Uh, Commissioner Gadway mentioned we did have a tri-county commissioner's meeting. That's not the first. We did do one the first year I was on the board, but we did have a little lapse where the three county commissioner groups get together to talk about mutual issues. And as Commissioner McConkie mentioned, they subject of the uh, Thomas Johnson Bridge came up because we did have a recent uptick in suicides off the bridge. So we all agreed to send a letter to State Highway asking if they could take some kind of action, safety action to maybe prevent those activities. Um, while it wouldn't get at the root of the, the core of why people do that, at least would take away their opportunity to um, use that bridge as a vehicle. Um, so been a pretty slow week and I uh, can't really think of anything else that went on this past week so uh, with that uh, oh I do want to remind people today we did adopt a resolution for the police accountability board and the charging committee we uh, anticipate opening up uh, the application period for that board on March 1st so those of you that are interested keep your eyes open and around March 1st should be available online to make an application and uh, we encourage anyone with an interest please apply uh, we have many boards and commissions if you are out there and have some time want to help uh, your community if you go on the website you see the vacancies that we have and you may see something that piques your interest um, oh the other thing that i did attend last week was the uh, we have a committee working on the incorporation of our career ems staff with the volunteer service and we've been in that now for about a year and uh so far, I have to admit, it's worked much better than I thought it would. Uh, we've had a very smooth transition compared to what has happened in other areas when they made that transition. So I give that credit to our staff and to the volunteers for making that work. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of an adjustment when you're there doing it for free and somebody's getting paid to do it and you're both doing the same thing. And uh, we're in their facilities operating their equipment uh, so there were a few bumps in the road, but uh, thanks to the great volunteers that we have and staff, we were able to work through those with no major issues. And uh, our citizens are getting better EMS service today than they've ever gotten in the history of this county because of that. So um, I want to thank all of you for making that work out the way it has. Uh, other than that, I think I'm done. Commissioner Weems, does you have a motion for me? Yes, sir, Mr. President. I'd like to make a motion to enter exec session pursuant to general provisions articles section 3-305b1i to discuss the appointment employment assignment promotion discipline demotion compensation removal resignation or performance evaluation of an appointee employee or official over whom it has jurisdiction and section 3-305b7 to obtain legal advice Second. I have a motion and a second to go into executive session. Any discussion on that motion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Everyone, have a great day.